We've come today to say goodbye to one who held us close to tell the stories of his life that move us each the most. These memories of a life well lived and of a death well faced are now a part of every life that crosses in this place. No circle has been broken here, no one that stands alone. The threads of life so lately broke Are woven through our own He'd hope to see us all again That gather here today but though we will not meet again here, we'll meet again each day. In work we do, in songs we sing, in courage and in pain, in battles that we fight as one, we'll see his face again. No circle has been broken here, no one that stands alone. The threads of life so lately broke are woven through I want to thank uh, Julie Buttell and Susan Newell and, Bill o and Bob O'Brien for your appropriate song that opens today's events. Uh, my name is David Elsola, and uh, Penny Baylor and I will be introducing our speakers today, many of whom have memories and reminiscences to share with you. And I want to thank you all for being here at this celebration of Tony's life. His wife, Mona, his daughter, Lindsay, and her wife, Drea, his son, Xander, his grandson, Sasha, his sister Kathy and Benny welcome you and thank you for your solidarity. We all knew Tony in different ways, as a friend, as a family member, as a community organizer and volunteer, as a social worker, a teacher, an activist, a baseball buddy. Today we'll hear many reminiscences and recollections about the life of this special person, a man who left us much too soon, but who leaves us with valuable lessons and indelible memories. <clears throat> For my own part, I met Tony in March 1982 when the Chilean resistance group Kile Payon sang at Masonic Temple at a concert arranged by the New American Movement of which Tony was a member. We struck up an easy conversation which Tony was so good at initiating and we became friends. Over the years, his family <clears throat> and ours drove together to civil rights and anti-war demonstrations in Washington. We vacationed in Maine. We went to President Obama's first inauguration. We traveled to out-of-town baseball games with a colorful troupe of friends called the Hack. More on that later. One event that we shared and that I remember vividly was when Katie and I were with Tony and Mona on their boat, Comic Dancer, bouncing over four-foot waves coming back from Ontario. Three of us were sitting in back, green at the gills, trying to stay calm as we watched Captain Tony at the helm, one hand on the wheel and the other holding a barf bag. It was, <laughs> it was a real balancing act for him, but Tony showed the same attributes at the wheel that day <clears throat> as he showed throughout his life care, concern, and confidence. We got back safely. Tony had an infectious sense of humor. 
Many of you heard him as a stand-up comic who performed at a comedy club in the Detroit area, as well as at the Buck Dinner. When George Bush and Dan Quayle were running for office, he helped write copy for a special edition of Solidarity Magazine, The Outrageous Adventures of George and Dan, coming up with rhymes that skewered George Bush and Dan Quayle in a Dr. Seuss style. He proudly displayed a trophy awarded by a national political writers group for that effort. One of Tony's passions was to bring educational opportunities to young people. He did so as a school board member, but the event that I, and as a teacher, but the event that I remember most clearly in this respect was his work with the Youth Leadership Program of the Cranbrook Peace Foundation. He and I and others arranged programs for 11th graders from throughout Metro Detroit to observe medical care, courtroom trials, immigrant farm labor, and more. Uh, as board members of the Cranbrook Peace Foundation, he and I and others took these students on a life-seeing trip to Mexico where we stayed with families and shared experiences long before any talk of a wall. Tony's love of people and his social values guided all of his life's work. He came from Los Angeles to Detroit, Center City, as a VISTA volunteer. He was an aide to Congressman George Crockett, Jr., with whom he helped address problems in Detroit and investigated atrocities in Central America. He ran for the Michigan State Senate. He served on his local school board. He taught at the University of Michigan. He attended every Tigers game he could, and for 25 years, he led a major social service agency, Common Ground. He truly was a Renaissance man, seemed to know everyone. He earned the nickname, rightfully, Mr. Network. The last time we were together in Detroit was at Cobo Hall last August. Tony and Mona had spent two years traveling around the country, as many of you know, in their RV. But wherever they were, they, were, they, they kept very close tabs on what was happening here in Michigan. And so when they came back for a visit in August, they wanted to hear gubernatorial candidate Abdul El Said with Senator Bernie Sanders. Political involvement was always important to Tony. It was shortly after that rally that Tony left for Massachusetts where he received his diagnosis of pancreatic cancer. From that moment until he took his final breath on January 21, he and his family reached out to their many circles of friends and stayed in contact so that we could all be part of the journey. With humor, warmth, honesty, and openness, they showed the same qualities that made them a strong and beloved part of our community. Penny Baylor, uh, today's co-host with me, has some memories to share, and she will then join in introducing others to tell you what they remember about Tony, the different parts of Tony's life, his family and his childhood, his life's work, his passions that ranged from sports to opera, his overarching love for his community, and most important, his optimism, his optimism and deep respect for the humanity in all of us. Tony's family has requested that uh, afterwards, we each take a moment to share a story about Tony or a lesson that you learned from him with someone you may not know. Please also take time to write a recollection on the cards you received as you came in, in lieu of a guest book, and write your thoughts on them, write your rec recollections on them, and then deposit them in the two boxes that are going to be in the back. Those memories will be shared with the family. There's information in the printed program that you all have on where to post memories and photos online and where donations can be made in Tony's honor. Now I'd like to introduce Penny Baylor, who for many years led the Detroit City Year program, working closely with Tony, Penny will share some of her thoughts. Hello, everyone. First, I think we have to congratulate all of ourselves. What a great crowd. What a turnout for Tony. Thank you for being here. I mean, this is a big auditorium, right? So, wow, I don't see that many seats available still. But I think it's wonderful. And who in the world would deserve this more than Tony Rothschild? I mean, he's just one of those super people in your lives that you never forget. And whenever I think of him, I start smiling. And that's, you know, that's hard to do some days. Um, 
So Tony and I uh, met in 1975 at the Wayne State Nursery School at the Jeffries Project, where both Lindsay and Ryan and my daughter Kelly uh, went to nursery school. And um, I, at the time, I was married to my late husband, Kermit, and he was born and raised in Detroit on, from the Old West Side. And he used to say, I spent my whole life trying to get out of the ghetto, and I married this white woman, and she sends my children to school in a, nurse, in a housing project. And, uh, well, it was, the best, it was the best nursery school in the city. It was a teacher training lab school uh, where the College of Education students were practicing their teacher training. So there would be five adults in a classroom of 13 little children. So that was quite an experience, and that's where we first met. Well, well the Wayne State Nursery School uh, program was so successful that the then Dean of Education at Wayne, Ed Simpkins, so, who many of you know, I'm sure, he called and he said, Penny, I'm thinking of starting an elementary school based on the same model as the nursery school. And I know you live downtown in Lafayette Park, and, and you, my, by that time my daughter was in kindergarten at, at the Chrysler, which is still one of the best schools in the state. Uh, and he said, would you be interested in putting Kelly and Ryan at Golightly if we started a new school there? I said, sign me up, I'll do it, because I was so in love with this model and with the people and the warmth and the high academic educational values of working with uh, an adult to child ratio like that. It was just fabulous. Um, I'll give you another story about that nursery school that I think is kind of funny. And I do this because Tony would be telling stories. So we're, uh, we're at the nursery school and it's, it's winter. And the, the parking lot, this is right over here on the Lodge Freeway, the parking lot is frozen and, and apparently, you know, the water from rain or whatever was frozen in rivulets. I mean, it wasn't like an ice skating rink. It was rivulets of water frozen. And so there I would be with Ryan, who was actually not old enough to be in the school. You were supposed to be three. He was 18 months old. And they said, well, we'll take him if you can put enough diapers on him because we don't change diapers. And I said, oh, okay. So here he is in his triple diapers. And so he's in his Oshkosh overalls and he's waddling, you know, with me across the frozen uh, tundra of this parking lot in the wintertime, and it was just a wonderful experience. Well, then in the spring, uh, the sun came out and it got warmer weather, and all the ice um, melted. And so then they said, well, we're gonna, you know, redo this parking lot because obviously something stopped up in the drain, uh, and we need to clean that out for next year. And they cleaned it out, and guess what was in the drain? A corpse! And here was my little 18-month-old toddler toddling across, and Lindsay was there. You know, we were all toddling across corpses and, and drains and stuff like that. But it was still the best nursery school on the planet, in my estimation. And it grew into the Golightly Education Center, which was K-8, through and it was over at the Balch School, which is just a block away. And they stayed together all the way up through 7th and 8th grade. So what an experience, and uh, what a joy it was to know Tony and Mona. And, and, and Lindsay. And so we, we went there, uh, and the next thing I wanted to tell you about is Vista. Uh, Tony, as you know, was a, mavel a marvelous executive of Vista and a member of Vista. And my uh, most recent employment before I retired three years ago was with City Year, which is also what's called an AmeriCorps program. AmeriCorps is like the Domestic Peace Corps, and Vista is part of AmeriCorps as well. And that, to me, says something about Tony that he would choose as his, 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 his career, not only all the social work things that he did at Common Ground, but it started at an early life, part of his life in Vista. And Vista is about service. And this is not easy service, being in AmeriCorps or in the Peace Corps. In the Peace Corps, you're of course going overseas, but in AmeriCorps, you're staying in this country and giving full-time service for a pittance, not minimum wage, less than minimum wage of any kind. It's like a stipend. Uh, and at the end of service of a year or two years, you get a $5,000 scholarship. Now you do. I don't know if they did way back then. But uh, that says to me everything about Tony. Uh, he was all about service. He was all about giving back. He was all about making a difference. He was all about patriotism for this country in the most positive, positive kind of way. So that's why it makes me smile every time I think of Tony. Uh, and then the one last thing I want to say at this point before we move on um, about Tony. You all know this, I'm sure, because you've read the obituary and you know him from knowing him. But who gets a call from Alan Trammell? 
who in the world gets a call from Alan Trammell unless you're Lou <laughs> Whitaker. So uh, that's what I wanted to say. So the next thing, my, my task is to introduce somebody wonderful. And I'm going to introduce Kathy Rothschild, who is Tony's sister. And she lives in Costa Rica. So we're just so happy to have her here and so proud to have her, to be a part of her wonderful family. So Kathy, come on up. To start, I want to thank all of you for being here to celebrate Tony. If he were with us, he'd say, I have a lot of great friends and family. He is. So let's start at Tony's very beginning. It was New Year's Eve, 1947, and my parents had just got a TV. Mom, very pregnant with Tony, and Dad had invited everyone over to watch the Rose Parade and football games on New Year's Day. So they spent the evening rearranging furniture and putting up decorations. Tony was due in a couple of weeks, but he wanted to join the party. So Mom went into labor in the wee hours of the morning, and off they dashed to the hospital, leaving a key under the mat and a note for everyone invited to make themselves at home. Tony was born January 1st at 10.46 a.m. in 1948. Rumor has it that everyone enjoyed the party. <laughs> when Tony was around three, Dad was logging hours to get his pilot's license. He would secretly take us flying every Saturday, telling Mom we were going to the amusement park. <laughs> she was a bit of a worrier and definitely wouldn't have allowed it. And on one of those Saturdays when we got home, Tony came in all excited and said, Hey, Mom, Mom, did you see us wave to you when, we were when you were hanging up the clothes? We flew right over. <laughs> what? Well, Tony had let the cat out of the bag. No more flights. But those flights with my dad instilled in both of us a great sense of adventure and a love of flying. Around that time, we had two Dachshunds named Tristan and Isolde. <laughs> my parents named them for the Wagner Opera. As kids, we heard a lot of opera in the house, and on the radio, and 78 LPs, and all over. I believe this planted the seed that later germinated in Tony's life when he became an opera buff. Those doxies, Tristan and Isolde, were the beginning of a long line of pets that passed through our lives. Tony had a pet rat named Egbert. He'd shut his bedroom door and let Egbert run free. One day when Tony and I were feeding the dogs and my cat Midnight, Midnight was missing. So we went looking and we finally heard Midnight crying locked in Tony's room with Guess who? <laughs> Tony broke into tears, thinking Egbert had become Midnight's lunch. We raced upstairs, burst into the room, and there they were playing together, like two old friends. It was a happy day. <laughs> we had a deep love of animals, and I don't think that either of us ever had a home without being with pets being part of our family. In the early 50s, if Tony were here, he could tell you the date. We moved into the house where we would grow up. The doors were always unlocked, and friends and family always welcome. And I don't mean just for an hour or two. If friends or family members were in need, our parents never hesitate to lend a helping hand. Aunt Lillian lived with us for six months, cousin Yale for seven months, cousin Douglas several months, Cousin Joan, one year. There were always people living with us. And as Tony and I became adults, we extended that same hospitality, we learned. Probably the most life-changing lesson, one of compassion, came when I was 13, Tony was 10. One of my friends, Sandy, who lived just a couple blocks away, spent most of her time at our house. My mother quickly discovered that Sandy's home life was a threat to her well-being. 
The long and short of it is my parents were given legal custody of Sandy after fighting with social services who thought placing a Catholic child with a Jewish family was not a good idea. Well, my parents won that battle, and Sandy and her dog came to live with us for five years. She was then and is now considered our sister. Early on, our parents not only taught us the meaning of compassion, but also zero tolerance for discrimination. When Tony and I were in our teens, we invited friends over to watch a basketball game. Tony could tell you who was playing. Some friends of my parents stopped by and were brought upstairs to say hello, and Tony and I introduced our friends, and the adults went back downstairs and, my parents, and said to my parents, What's with the Schwarzes? The Yiddish word for blacks. Well, my parents promptly asked them to leave and after years of friendship, never spoke to them again. They also set other friends straight when they questioned our dear Mario, a gray-haired, gay Argentinian who was a live-in helper with us for many years. One of my parents' friends asked, aren't you afraid to leave Tony alone with him? My mom snapped back, not any more afraid than I am of leaving Tony alone with you. <laughs> These incidents and my parents' response set quite an example for Tony and me. One summer, an old army buddy of my father said, hey Al, could you host a young Korean student from Juilliard for the summer? Sure, why not, dad replied. His name was Tony Hahn, so my brother became Little Tony. That summer, Little Tony and I listened to Tony Hahn rehearse Rachmaninoff's Rhapsody in Athema Paganini over and over for hours and hours every day. And just when we thought we couldn't take it anymore, the whole family was invited to attend his solo performance with the LA Philharmonic at the Hollywood Bowl. Wow, Tony and I just looked at each other and went, wow, he's incredible. That summer, we learned what one can accomplish with commitment, dedication, and hard work. Tony and I were afforded many activities growing up. One is swimming lessons. We both loved to swim and would stay in the water until our lips turned blue. We also took ceramic classes, and we still have pieces we painted together in 1956. There were also dance lessons, and we performed in dance recitals. Tony and I performed a tap duet together, and then for my grandparents' 50th anniversary, we partnered and performed the Hungarian Shardash. It's no wonder, with all that dancing in our early years, he married a dancer, Mona. Tony also studied drums, and he played in the school band. One day, members of the band were invited to audition for the film of The Music Man. At the audition, there was a long line trailing around the blocks. Their chances looked pretty slim. Then someone walked down the line asking if anyone played the glockenspiel. And Tony said to his friend, hey, come on, let's raise our hands. And the rest is history. <laughs> Don't blink at the end of the movie because you'll miss Tony's big Hollywood debut. That's him in the back left corner. <laughs> okay. While mom ensured we had access to the arts, dad took care of another part of our education. I'm sure we were the only kids in grammar school who could read a racing form. Dad would take us to the race tacks to watch the early morning workouts. A day at the races became a common family outing. In 1965, my father, with a group of his friends, purchased a racehorse named Green Banner. He just won the Irish Derby. My father flew to Ireland to escort him back, and we all went to the airport to greet them. Now that my father was an owner, Tony and I were allowed to walk and groom the horses. And the most thrilling thing of all was when we won, we got to go to the winner's circle. Tony later grew from being a fan to being a part owner himself. I remember once someone jokingly asked Tony, so is 
part of a group, what part of the horse do you own? Without missing a beat, he said, the nose. It's the only part I can afford, but it's the part that wins. <laughs> <laughs> that was Tony's sense of humor, and many of his close childhood friends have similar and hilarious heartwarming stories about him. I encourage you to read them. They'll be posted on Caring Bridge. We had a very happy childhood together. It was full of friends and family, and most importantly, we were loved. But in 1969, our bubble burst. Tony was a couple hours away at college, and I was living at home, working as a lab technician at the local hospital. One day, Dad slept in late, which was very strange, as it was Super Bowl Sunday. I went in to give him a nudge and found he was unconscious. I screamed for my mom, called 911, and called Tony. Dad was rushed to the hospital where I worked. And as we were all waiting at the hospital, Tony said, what do you think happened? A heart attack? Stroke? Then the doctor came out and told us, he's going to be fine. He just took an overdose of pills. This made no sense in our world. We, cu we couldn't wrap our heads around it. Afterward, there was no offer of help or counseling for any of us, even my father. My parents advised Tony and I not to speak about it. I went to work the next day at the hospital, and of course, everyone in the lab knew what had happened. I felt they looked at me differently. There was a lot of shame involved. The following week, my dad sat the family down and said, I did something wrong. It won't happen again. But in 1985, he took his own life. I later sat, sought counseling, and Tony found common ground where he worked tirelessly to take away the stigma and shame of mental illness. He was always there for those in need. As adults, we lived a few states apart and eventually a few countries apart. If any serious event, good or bad, happened in my life, he was always there for me without ever being asked. We were very close. I remember the last time I saw Tony, just as I was leaving the house in East Hampton, Tony called me into the room and I sat down next to him and he took my hand and he looked me in the eye and he said, I couldn't have had a better sister. You've done so much for my family, especially my kids. I can't thank you enough. Well, I couldn't have had a better brother. I can hardly remember a week that passed that we didn't have our treasured weekly phone calls. I'm so proud of the incredible person he became. He taught me a lot about how to live and how to die with dignity, strength, bravery, and humor while surrounded by love. I love my little brother and I'll be with him forever. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy. Uh, and now uh, I'd like to introduce two members of the family, uh, Tony's nephews. And Tony's love for children who grow up to be great, nephew, great adults is legendary. And this is Colin Nance and Ryan Nance coming forward. Welcome, Colin and Ryan. Thank you. Uh, I'm Ryan Nance. Uh, this is my brother, Colin. We are the sons of uh, Michelle Hauser, who was born Michelle Scott. Uh, so that is Mona's older sister. Um, and we are here representing uh, the four uh, nephews of Tony and Mona. In the summer of 1982, my brother and mother and I got on a bus a Greyhound bus in Redlands, California. And we were taking a trip across the country to stop and visit with lots of friends and family. And one of the stops that I remember most, of course, was here in Detroit. And so there were so many great memories about that uh, visit. We got to see their house. We got to see how they lived. Um, uh, Xander at the time was two. I remember him standing in a high chair in Windsor, screaming, Augie, 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 at an Italian restaurant, <laughs> which was great. 
Uh, but one of the most, uh, one of the memories that has stuck with me the most over the years was one night they gathered together a bunch of bicycles and we rode uh, through the, the night streets of Detroit. This is all very new for me from being from suburban uh, Southern California. Uh, night streets of Detroit on bicycles by ourselves with the family uh, down to the park. Uh, I don't even remember what the name of the park was, but I do remember that it was for a festival that I remember it as the Afro-American Festival. This was all very different from, from where I came from when, and what I expected. I remember so much, I remember the people and the music. Uh, I remember people on uh, roller skates and I remember lots of glow sticks. I was eight uh, and he was 11. And uh, Tony and Mona introduced us to something so different with such, uh, such a kind, open smile and laugh uh, that it sort of stuck with me. Uh, much later in life when they were traveling around the country in their sprinter van, uh, we were lucky enough to have them come visit in Sarasota, Florida, visit me and my two kids at the time, eight and 11, and got to see them again this last summer in Big Bear. Um, so just recently I was asking Willa and Jude uh, what their impressions of great uncle Tony were. And they both said, without skipping a beat, that he was very kind and very funny, which I think sums up pretty well. And I, so I asked them what they sort of meant. Um, and in talking to them a little bit about it, it became clear to me they didn't mean polite. A lot of people kind of confuse kind and polite. I've known a lot of people that are a lot more polite than Uncle Tony was. Uh, but I didn't know many people that were more kind than he was. Uh, so then talking to my friend the other day, I, I was trying to figure out like, obviously with such a man as Tony, it's hard to wrap your head around exactly in a couple words what he can mean to you. Um, so she was asking about like, you know, what impact did he have on my life beyond just sort of the family memories? And there were so many family memories. Um, so I, I realized that he uh, became a real sort of introduction to me about, about what, it, what it meant to be active, to, to activism. Uh, what it meant to, to pick up the stewardship of being a citizen. And it, it was done with a smile, you, you know, right? It wasn't done out of out of uh, fierce anger, it was done with kindness and with humor. And I realized that he and those experiences became really emblematic experiences that I shuffled into my deck, that deck that you carry around with you uh, when you're challenged or when you have opportunities. And, and I realized that when I had uh, opportunities to look at difference and uh, newness and decide if it was uh, a kind experience or not, I had this really great model um, in Uncle Tony. So the, the way that I wanted to sum it up for, for uh, my feelings about him was that he was this incredibly kind and incredibly funny man. He was an amazing uncle and a beautiful model of how to live in a way that resists the notion that difference leads to division and refutes the worry that opportunities to connect with others are scarce. He lived, in my estimation, a life of abundance, abundant joy, abundant courage, abundant humor, and abundant love. It's always hard to follow my brother, who's such an eloquent uh, poet by training. Um, I'm more, much more comfortable speaking in numbers, but. Uh, I do believe, you know, I, I do agree with all of that. I do, th when I think of my childhood with Uncle Tony, um, just his amazing ability to connect with us as kids on our level. Um, and I, the, you know, the, the times I've seen him with Sasha reminds me a lot of, you know, the, the times in, in Detroit that year in 1982 and the many other times that I had an opportunity to, uh, to, to be with him. He was always fun to be around. He always had a smile on his face. He always, had something exciting to tell us or something fun to do, like the bike ride or, or whatever. Um, a couple of specific examples that I remember from that, that are ways that he connected with me personally. Um, and maybe I was an easy mark because I was kind of a sports crazy kid. And as we know, Tony was kind of a sports nut himself. So, so maybe I was a little easy mark. But um, so, you know, we, we were always talking about the Dodgers or the or the uh, Tigers or, or whomever and talking about all the, the sports statistics because I was kind of a emerging stat, a stats geek at the time. Um, now I'm a full-fledged one, but, um, but anyway, so he introduced me to this amazing game which maybe a couple of you in the, in the here know about which is called Stratomatic Baseball. 
Um, which, for those of you who don't know, it's kind of, I think, a more pure form of fantasy baseball than the thing they call fantasy baseball today. Uh, it's basically a dice game where you have cards representing individual player, actual players, but you actually create games that never happened, you know, because you, by rolling the dice, but it's actually just, uh, statistically based. And, and as an 11-year-old, I was in heaven. And it created an amazing connection that, that he and I had for several years after that. He sent me books by Bill James, who uh, he was a, you know, the, the vanguard of the analytics movement in sports. You know, and this was 1985. He gave me a book on, uh, by Bill James. And it just created a connection for us that, that persisted till the very end. You know, we, we talked about that baseball in November when I went to visit him. Um, I was in his fantasy baseball league for the last 15 years. One of the other, uh, another example that, that I remember and refer to a lot in my, in my life is, uh, you know, as an alumnus of the University of Michigan, he had access to the Rose Bowl tickets when they, when they were available. <laughs> and, and we lived in Southern California, so he couldn't always make it. So uh, I remember very uh, specifically, we went, uh, uh, this was 1987, so it was the, the Jim Harbaugh-led uh, University of Michigan uh, team went to, uh, we went to see that. That was my first ever, I think, live major sporting event besides, besides the Dodgers. Uh, first football game anyway. So it was just very, very exciting, very thrilling. And, and again, created a, a, it was a great way for him to connect with, with, uh, with me and, and with us. Um, and lastly, um, a few years later, when I went to college, uh, 3,000 miles away from home, I was on the East Coast. And, um, you know, too far away to go home for, hol for all the holidays and things like that. And as, as luck would have it, one of my college roommates was from Troy, Michigan. And so I would hitch a ride with him, with home with him every, um, every Thanksgiving and, and then head up to Lake Orion and spend, spend Thanksgiving with Tony and Mona and uh, Lindsay and Xander. And I just remember always looking forward to those times so much because it was, you know, A, a home away from home, and B, you know, it was such a fun household to, to be part of, you know, for, even for just a few days. Um, and, and it also exposed me, I think, to one of the reasons this room is so full, just the, his, there was always friends around. He, I, think, I think you guys probably invented Friendsgiving, you know? Um, and, it, and it was just something that, that sort of, uh, I would love to emulate as an adult, and I try, but it's really, and, and he was a great example. You, you as well, Mona, are a great example of that. So um, again, great, great models for how to, how to make connections with people and how to, how to, how to live your life. Um, and, uh, you know, I'll certainly miss him a lot, but I, you know, I, I still will always feel the connection to him and will, will think fondly of, of all, the, all the memories that I have that, that he was help, a great help in fostering. We'd like to bring back to the microphone Julie Butel, local activist and singer, uh, to do one of uh, the favorite songs of Mona. Mona has uh, written some additional lyrics for it, and uh, I'd like to introduce Julie again. So if you didn't catch what uh, Dave said, some of these words were written by Mona. I'll be seeing you in all the old familiar places that this heart of mine embraces all day through the peace and justice way a boat upon the bay i'll always see your face when horses race road trips any place i'll be seeing you in every lovely summer's day in everything that's fun and play i'll always think of you that way i'll find you in the morning sun and when the night is new i'll be looking at the moon but i'll be seeing you I'll be seeing you in all the old familiar places that this heart of mine embraces all day through. On any hiking trail, at opera arias, laughter, baseball games, nothing 
will ever be the same I'll be seeing you in every lovely summer's day In everything that's fun and play I'll always think of you that way I'll find you in the morning sun And when the night is new I'll be looking at the moon But I'll be seeing you Thank you, thank you, Julie. One of those familiar places for Tony and Mona was on Commonwealth Street in Detroit, where for many years uh, Tony and Mona lived. Commonwealth Street became a, kind of a gathering place for Vista volunteers, for community organizers and workers. And uh, here to talk about uh, the house on Commonwealth Street uh, are Susan Newell and Tom Clark, who both, uh, who both shared the, the, the house with Tony and Mona. Susan, Tom. Thank you, Dave and, and Penny. Uh, I'm happy to be here with, with Susan to talk about some of our time on Commonwealth. Uh, first of all, can't see you, but Mona, Lindsay, Xander, Drea, Sasha, Kathy, and all the other members of the Scott Rothschild Marx family, my love uh, and my heart goes out to you. What incredible courage and dedication you showed in the last six months. And thank you for the opportunity to say a few words about my best friend, or my brother, Tony Rothschild. Tony and I met in the corridors of the Detroit City Council. It was 1972. We were 24-year-old graduate students, each working as an intern for a member of the Detroit City Council. Tony and I quickly found our common ground. Guess what? Baseball. Tiger baseball. And thanks to Tony, we had our own unique way of getting excited about the Tigers. Shortly after we met, Tony came up to me one day following a Tiger victory. The first words of his, out of his mouth to me were, what a ball game. But Tony didn't say, what a ball game. He said, what a ball game. After another victory, Tony came up to me and said, how about those Tigers? <laughs> Tony sounded like Ernie Harwell giving the post-game tiger, tiger highlights or Milwaukee Brewers announcer Bob Euchre doing a beer commercial. <laughs> I don't know whether Tony picked up this uh, way of speaking from fellow Vista volunteer Tom Lonergan <laughs> or whether Tony made this up himself. But wherever it came from, it soon became our way of talking and getting excited about Tiger games. This far announcer-like voice spilled over into other conversations we had about politics and just plain random events. We continued to sprinkle our conversations in this manner with this shtick right through the final year of Tony's life. But getting to what we're talking about, to, we're talking about Commonwealth. A few years after I met Tony and then Mona, I moved in and shared their little red brick house on Commonwealth Street just a few blocks from here. Yes, we were one of those so-called urban communes. We were doing the radical thing of sharing housing, food, and responsibility for meals. And over the years, as Dave has said, I was just one of several friends who became Tony and Mona's housemates. Another one, Susan Newell, will speak in a moment. And living with Tony and Mona and four-year-old Lindsay at that time was just the start of a longtime family bond among us that only grew as the years went by. One evening on Commonwealth, Tony and I sat listening to Ernie Harwell, of course, doing the play-by-play -play of a Tiger game on the radio. After several hours, Ernie Harwell said, well, we got a real barnstormer here. We're going into extra innings. Tony jumped up and said, hey, let's go to the ballpark. 
As you know, Tiger Stadium was just six or seven blocks down the street from where we lived. We jumped into Tony's little, red, blue, a little blue Dodge Dart, raced down Trumbull Avenue towards the stadium, and we parked. I followed Tony as he ran towards the stadium exit, where people were, were bailing out of the extra inning game. They didn't want to watch it. And uh, then Tony walked up to the usher guarding the exit, and I saw Tony slip $2 into his pocket. <laughs> And Tony said, come on, let's go. I gave him $2, and voila, the usher looked the other way as we, looked the other way as we snuck into the stadium. We then ran through the stadium to the now largely empty seats behind the Tiger dugout, and we commandeered seats that we never could afford for a nine-inning game. We sat hoping the Tigers would win a thrilling victory in the bottom of the 10th, the 11th, the 12th, the 13th, or whenever the game would end, so that we could walk out of the game and we could turn to each other and say, what a ball game. <laughs> Living on Commonwealth, however, I came to learn some elements of Tony's core personality. Kathy has already talked about and given us the highlights, given us some insight into the progressive values that Al and Claire Rothschild instilled in their children. It's quite clear that Tony adhered to those all his life. But Tony had a couple of other overriding personal attributes. First of all, Tony's humanity towards others was palpable. You could sense it when someone first met him. Tony always tried to connect or empathize with someone he met for the first time. He used stories, humor, similar experiences, sports, common friends, whatever it took to establish a common bond with a person that, that hadn't existed before. And, you know, Tony just seemed to enjoy so much connecting with people, with whomever he met and wherever he met them. But Tony also, but, but, but in a group of people, Tony did not just work a room for himself. He connected a room for others. It's fitting that Tony concluded his professional career directing an organization called Common Ground, because the desire for common ground with others is what I saw in Tony's personality from the earliest days of our friendship. I can illustrate Tony's most enduring trait and perhaps some of his legacy by analogizing it to a wagon wheel. Envision Tony at the center of the wheel, the axis, and then think of Tony and Mona's friends emanating outward as spokes of that wheel. And finally, think of all those friends forming the rim of the wheel. Like many of you here today, I have met so many wonderful, dedicated people through Tony and Mona. So whenever I see those people, I think of Tony, who connected us on that wheel of friendship and solidarity. The last thing I want to say is directed towards Sasha. And if I can find my notes, I'll do that. Sasha, I like your t-shirt, Sasha. Tigers, I like that. Now, Sasha, you know, in the coming years, you will learn about some great leaders and what they did for other people, like Dr. Martin Luther King and Sojourner Truth, Nelson Mandela, Joe Hill, and of course, Rosa Parks. Your GPA admired these leaders and liked them he answered the call to serve others. You may not read about your GPA in school like those other leaders, but always remember this. Your GPA made a big difference in the lives of so many, many people, including everybody in this room. Sasha, we will work to keep your GPA Tony's memory alive. Thank you. To say that Tony Rothschild dramatically altered the course of my life would not be an exaggeration. In 1972, Tony and I were classmates in the U of M School of Social Work. I was at loose ends in my life, so Tony said, why don't you come to Detroit and become a VISTA volunteer? It was a great experience for me and Mona. I can introduce you to people and you can stay with us until you get settled in. In a few months, I had a pallet on the floor of a spare room in their Cass Corridor apartment until I found a more permanent home. True to his word, Tony, and Mona too, 
became the connective tissue that bound me to a new community. Tony and Mona's friends <clears throat> soon became my own, and their adopted city became mine as well. A year or two later, Tony and Mona invited me to live with them in Woodbridge. A married couple, a toddler, and two unrelated adults. Some might have called that a hippie commune, but we just called it a family of choice. Now you can quickly learn a lot about somebody when you live with them, right? <laughs> Here's what I learned about Tony. He was always generating ideas for projects. In our egalitarian household, we took turns cooking from two vegetarian cookbooks, Recipes for a Small Planet and Mmm, mm, a feastiary. <laughs> the folks who wrote Mmm, mm, were clearly hippies. They suggested that you didn't really need a set of dishes. You could eat from pie pans, cutting boards, or in a pinch, hubcaps. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> Tony suggested that we make our own collection of favorites from these cookbooks, and so a loose leaf binder called The Notebook was created. Now, vegetarianism was in its infancy in this, in this country then, so the recipes deemed not for The Notebook unfortunately grew almost as long as the ones for The Notebook. <laughs> I think we all agreed that the bean loaf with tomato cheese sauce was more like a sauce-covered doorstop than a dinner entree. <laughs> Tony's idea gave us something to laugh about when dinner didn't live up to our expectations and added a little pizzazz to a sometimes mundane job. If Tony were in The Little Rascals, he'd be the one with the line, hey kids, let's put on a show. Tony was an easygoing guy. One night, I was babysitting for two-year-old Lindsay. Yes, it's going to be that story, Lindsay. <laughs> I had some tea sitting on the arm of a sofa, and Lindsay came over, tipped the mug to look inside, and spilled some of the tea on herself. She cried a little. I washed the tea off, comforted her, and that was that, or so I thought. But then Tony and Mona came home, the parents came home, and discovered a small second-degree burn on Lindsay's belly. She still makes a point to show me the scar whenever she sees me, and I'm sure she'd be happy to share it with you as well. <laughs> but there were no recriminations from Tony or Mona. They just whisked Lindsay off to the ER. Unfortunately, because she'd also been recently butted by a goat, this second trip to the ER prompted an encounter with Child Protective Services. <laughs> but it turned out okay, and Lindsay was allowed to remain in the home. <laughs> Tony was enthusiastic about so many things. Delight came easily to him, and he loved sharing his latest interests. I remember sitting in the Commonwealth living room while Tony curated a recording of his newest discovery, the Don Shirley Trio. This was long before Shirley became so widely known through the movie Green Book. Years later, Tony would rave about the Lady Gaga concert he had just attended, when almost everyone else our age was still saying, Lady Gaga? <laughs> Now, in pursuit of a fair and balanced view of Tony, I tried to think of times when he'd really annoyed me. <laughs> the only incident I could remember happened one Thanksgiving in Lake Orion. We arrived at the appointed time for dinner, and Tony greeted us by saying, I've just got to run for the, to the store for a turkey and a few other things. I'll be right back. <laughs> <laughs> at least that's the way I remember it, and it's my memory. <laughs> Tony could strike up a conversation with a rock and make it feel comfortable. <laughs> I think Tony's ease with rocks and people stemmed from the fact that he was so incredibly comfortable in his own skin and so deeply optimistic. His view of the world was, I'm good, you're good, and the world is pretty awesome. When you carry that attitude with you, you're bound to make friends wherever you go experience delight wherever you go, and do good wherever you go. You'll live well, die well, and leave behind an extraordinary example of a life well lived. Thank you.
was wonderful. Thank you. Um, I now have the pleasure to introduce two other very important people uh, who were friends of Tony and Mona uh, on Lake or in their Lake Orion home where they lived for many, many years, Ken Mogo and Maria Yamasaki. Hi. Um, when Mona spoke to me about our gathering here today, she said, wouldn't it be wonderful if everyone turned to someone that they didn't know and asked, how did you know Tony? What an excellent question. How did you know Tony? There are so many ways, as we've been hearing, sports, comedy, politics, the weddings that he officiated at, maybe yours, the buck dinner, racehorses. Maybe he helped you connect with mental health resources or gave you your diploma or was your professor. The list goes on and on. We knew Tony because he and Mona were woven into our community in Lake Orion. They would show up on Halloween, sometimes in costume, have a bowl of soup and then go out onto the porch to pass out candy and crack jokes with the little kids that came along. Soon they would move on to another friend's porch and then on to another. They came to Easter brunch and Tony never failed to crack a joke about being Jewish at an Easter brunch. Every, every year he cracked the same joke. <laughs> we gathered together to watch election returns, sometimes elated, sometimes crushed, but the, uh, there's so much truth in his optimism, even with politics, which can be really difficult. Um, and my husband Kim joined Tony and his friends in sports events, and Tony made the introduction at the Buck Dinner to Fred Wood, one of Tony's longtime friends, which led Kim to the best job he ever had. Tony and I were on the Lake Orion School Board. Tony was there for eight years, four as president. He saw himself as a helper and a collaborator and took every opportunity to get to know and encourage and bring resources to the district and the staff, whom he knew by name, all of them, I think. To go to a conference with Tony was like taking a master class in networking. He lobbied for a performing arts center at the new high school when it was being built. His passion sprang from a personal love of performing arts, but also from the knowledge of how young people in their developing years thrive from their connection to the arts. When tragedy struck the schools with a series of suicides, he brought in the resources of common ground to help the community and the families um, cope. And the community has turned to common ground often since then. Our gathering here today celebrates Tony's life and our connection to him. Tony and Mona held their own celebration, though, that, um, of their lives together following his retirement when they hit the road to Costa Rica, Nicaragua, and then spent so many um, years crisscrossing the nation, reconnecting and savoring friendships of decades with so many of the folks who had shared different times in their lives. We visited Tony in the final weeks of his life in their home near Lindsay Andrea. It was deeply moving to find Tony very weak, but sense of humor intact, in the loving care of Mona, Lindsay Andrea, Xander, Sasha, the little river jumper, and Benny, and the warm, calm shelter that they created. Cards, letters, poems, drawings, photos, and loving notes to each other covered the walls and the doorways of the home. Tony posed a question to us. How do you feel when you're faced with a serious illness? He went on to say that he felt he had gone through the stages of grief pretty quickly and that he was okay. His concern was for Mona and for how she would manage without him. Their deep love for each other filled their home. This morning I received an email from Jack and Marilyn's daughter, Annie Kablishka Becker, a one of the stops on Tony and Mona's travels in Oregon. She sends her love and this final thought, which is a quote. She offers her deepest gratitude for Tony's life and the ripples of goodness that will come to the world because of him for lifetimes to come.
kind of hard to avoid some repetition, but it's, it's worthy. In life, unlike in baseball, you never know what inning you're in. So a smart person like Tony lives their life like each day and each person matter. For many years, Tony and Mona, or Tona and Moni, as we <laughs> call them, and Lindsay and Xander lived just down Indian Lake Road from us. Maureen and Mona hiked all over, regardless of the weather. Lindsay babysat Megan and Katie. Tony and I, Tony was working for Congressman Crockett then, and I worked downtown and we carpooled together frequently. And whoever, was, whoever wasn't driving read the free press sports section aloud to the other. This was obviously before the newspaper strike because no scab papers for any of us. As, as Maria has mentioned, Tony was very involved with Lake Orion schools, and he used that involvement to make yet another very human connection. As you also know from Kathy, Tony was an extra in uh, The Music Man, and one year L.O. put on uh, The Music Man as the, as the school musical. So, of course, Tony got a job, or got a, part, a bit part, and uh, fit right in with all the students, and it was very sweet. When Tony ran for state senate in 1990, many of us worked on his campaign. He brought that same infectious optimism to this challenge that he brought to everything else. He lost in the primary to Gary Peters, which was fortuitous for both. Tony became available to be hired by Common Ground, and Gary's done okay, uh, too. For a few of us, socializing, as has obviously been mentioned a lot, frequently meant sports, including LO football games when Xander was on the team, and uh, uh, other events. Uh, several times, Tony and Kim Yamasaki and Jacob Liska and I bought tickets a year in advance for uh, March Madness regional or sub-regional at the Palace or at Ford Field. And as uh, to echo what Tom said, uh, after any big game, U of M or Tigers in particular though, Tony or I would uh, reach out to the other, what a ball game. And, uh, or in more, more recent years, sometimes that would be a text. I knew things weren't going well last fall when I texted Tony after a U of M football game and he didn't reply. Tony was a natural teacher. He was grateful for his many advantages in life, as you know and committed to paying his knowledge and experience forward. His last act of profound teaching was how he, along with Mona and Lindsay, Andrea, and Xander, faced his impending death. They faced the truth unflinchingly with love, dignity, and new humor. When Maria and Kim and Maureen and I trekked to East Hampton in November, excuse me, in December, Tony's weight was al already frighteningly down, and he had been napping when we arrived. He came out of his bedroom into the room where we were and announced, I'm back from Buchenwald. Tony mused about his legacy, but he needn't have. His legacy is at Common Ground, U of M Social Work School, the Buck Dinner, the Buck Dinner community, uh, the Lake Orion Schools. It's in Lindsay, Andrea, and Xander, and Sasha, and in all of us here today. And in the many ways he enriched so many people's lives with love, passion, and compassion. Oliver Wendell Holmes once said that as life is action and passion, it is required of a person that they be part of the actions and passions of their times at risk of being judged not to have lived. By this or any measure, Tony lived. Thank you, Maria and, and Ken. You've already heard uh, from Tom Clark and others about Tony's love of baseball and particularly the Detroit Tigers. Well, Tony also was a fan of basketball, football, boxing, horse racing, and we have a couple of uh, friends and comrades, uh, Tom Lonergan and Steve Babson, who shared many of Tony's sports aficionados, and I'd like to invite them to the stand now. Well, thank you. So you've heard, what a ball game, uh, several times. And um, as my habit is, I generally uh, find a phrase like that and use it way too often. So when I would um, see Tony, I wouldn't say hello, but I'd go, what a ball game. And he'd respond, which one? Um, and indeed, which one? Because, you know, he followed a lot of sports, uh, baseball, football, basketball, boxing, horse racing, hockey, the Olympics, uh, probably even sailing regattas. I'm, I'm not sure. 
But his interest in sports was very much uh, the social Tony. The games were social occasions uh, with family and friends. And sometimes uh, among the friends, uh, there was a little matchmaking involved in, in attending uh, a sporting event. Living on Commonwealth, uh, as Tom Clark and, uh, and Susan uh, pointed out, uh, in the mid-70s with the uh, Rothschild-Scott family, uh, we were uh, less than a mile from Michigan and Trumbull. Uh, visits to Tiger Stadium were fun and frequent. The uh, upper deck bleachers at that time were a community quite apart from, from the rest of the park. Um, and if uh, those who were there, uh, you know what I'm talking about. Um, you could get a contact high uh, there. Uh, there was no need to be shy or discreet about it. Uh, it wasn't legal then, but I guess it may be pretty soon. <laughs> Many memories, but a couple of stand out. And um, in the bleachers, we're back in the bleachers, standing for the national anthem in those years, in the 70s, was pretty much ignored. And I remember one game <clears throat> where Tony and I did. And uh, we had a discussion about it first. Uh, the circumstances is uh, Tony's, uh, uh, Mona's parents were in town. And we were at a game with uh, Tony's father-in-law, uh, Mona's dad, who we affectionately referred to as the Colonel. <laughs> and uh, I still vividly see the Colonel uh, during the national anthem, standing at attention, hand over his heart, eyes laser focused on that flag in center field. Uh, Tony and I were behind him, we were standing, but we were wondering why this was taking so long. <laughs> Tony preferred better seats than the bleachers. Uh, he had a time-tested strategy. This is another spin on the $2 uh, question uh, issue Tom raised. Um, usually at the end of the second inning, we were in the bleachers, but we would head for the inside gate at Tiger Stadium that blocked the bleachers from the grandstand. <clears throat> Tony would wrap a couple of dollars in his palm, approach the usher at the gate, and say, we're headed to section 221. The gate usher accepted the tip and opened the gate. We are on our way. And he always knew there would be seats in that section because that was an obstructed view section. And even despite that, it provided a great view of home plate. Now, I tried this seat upgrade on my own once or twice, and I failed. <laughs> the Heck Wilson tour began some 40 years ago when some workmates of mine at the Observer and Eccentric newspapers, I don't know if you remember those, I think they're still around, uh, we decided to head for a baseball weekend in Chicago. Uh, over the years, the group grew and has been to numerous cities uh, sporting major and minor league baseball teams. Uh, a classic hack was considered a trek to Chicago and Milwaukee, departing from Detroit on a Thursday night, sometimes it involved a Tiger game, or a Friday morning. A uh, few beers were consumed uh, during these excursions. Tony's first year on the hack uh, was probably the second or third one. I know it was in the early 80s. He helped organize hack tours, suggesting games to go to, and uh, he coordinated rides to, to get everybody there. He also fashioned himself the hack research director. And uh, Hack Wilson was a uh, baseball player in the 20s and 30s. Uh, he wasn't, uh, he, he, he wasn't, there he is, he, he wasn't these uh, sculpted, um, you know, uh, athletes we see today. He was, uh, he, well, he was what he was. He was very small, and, uh, but he hit well. He uh, still holds the National League record for RBIs. And, uh, but Tony, as the research director, wanted to find out a little more about him. So uh, I'm not sure when this was, but this was on House of Representatives a note paper, so it, so it had to be in the 80s, and he wrote me a memo. Tom, this is his dad uh, part of him, what time do you go to work? It must be early since you're never home when I call. <laughs> Anyways, my diligent research efforts have produced, one, a telephone conversation with Mayor Bill Clohan of Martinsburg, West Virginia. Two, confirmation by the mayor that A, Hack's grave is at the Rosedale Cemetery in Martinsburg, B, Hack's son, 
Robert E. Wilson, lives in Martinsburg on Baker Road. C, Hack's wife, hired private detectives to watch Hack. D, the mayor went to New York in 1979 for the Wilson induction into the Hall of Fame. How did we miss that? Um, he wanted us to invite the son on, on one of our tours, and I really can't remember if that ever happened. <laughs> now, the hack was so family friendly that uh, Tony brought uh, young Lindsay on uh, one of these tours in the early 80s. I think the first year was, um, was uh, 84. Uh, Mona and Xander would join the hack uh, a couple of years later. During the 84 hack, uh, we had a magical connection with another of Tony's sports loves, professional boxing. Wrigley Field had no lights at that time, so following the Friday afternoon game, uh, we were searching for a bar. We had an agenda, however. It just so happened that Detroit's uh, Tommy Hearns was fighting Roberto Duran that June night for some kind of championship, and we found a place that had the uh, fight on cable. So an hour or so passes, and just before the fight was to start, who walks in but some Cubs players? And uh, no doubt, with uh, Tony's encouragement, Lindsay grabs uh, some of these hack baseball hats, I still have one, and presents them to the Cubs. And uh, they put them on, and uh, we all had a great, great time. Now this was before the Biff and Mimi bowling shirts and the fezes, which Tony and family wore proudly, and you saw some pictures that are, that are proof of that. So, that night, Hearns knocked Duran out, the place went crazy, we headed for Milwaukee to see the Tigers whip the Brewers, and that year the Tigers would go on to win the World Series. And several of us got tickets later to the World Series game in Detroit, courtesy of Tony. So all I can say is, what a ball game. Tony looked great in a fez. Uh, and going to any sporting event with Tony was uh, a lot of fun for me, um, something I look forward to. Tony loves sports, a whole lot of sports, and he seemed to always know what the next best live event was going to be. And for him, they were always social events. Uh, with that smile and his organizing ability, there'd be a whole crew of people. I met a whole lot of folks, some of them I'm still friends with. Um, many of them are here today. but. Uh, he wanted to bring his friends along, and I think one thing we might want to add about the Hack Wilson, um, all of these jerseys we wore either said Biff or Mimi. A lot of that was because Tony had invited so many people over the years that it was impossible to keep track of people's names, especially because there was usually more than a contact high that was interfering with recollection. <laughs> so we decided the easiest thing to do was that we'd all be either Biff or Mimi, and that, that worked. Um, and Tony was a great fixer. He could arrange for all kinds of events, which for me were well beyond my pedestrian grasp. So I ended up at the 2006 final game of the American League playoff series, in which Maglio Ordonez hit the walk-off home run that sent the Tigers to the World Series. And Tony had managed to get tickets for seats right on the third baseline. Wonderful spot. And as many people have mentioned, Tony's recall of these events was impressive. I had to go back and look up what the particulars were of that game. Tony could have told you who the starting pitcher was, who the relief pitcher was, what inning it was, who was on base. That was Tony. Um, he could cite every detail of those kinds of events. He also had a feel for how to how to get to events which otherwise would have eluded me. I always felt like the lucky foreign exchange student who was along for the ride as Tony would explain what the hell was going on on the more, ex more obscure kinds of moments we spent. But the one in particular that stands out uh, was Tony and I ended up with ringside seats at what some people regard as the, the most impressive ra three rounds of boxing in the history of the sport. The Hearns-Hagler fight, 1985, uh, in Las Vegas, Nevada. And this was a Tommy Hearns, as, as Tom mentioned, was someone that we had followed, and Tom and Tony and I would go to Olympia, we're dating ourselves here, and watch Tommy Hearns fight and win the championship, and then he's going to Las Vegas to fight uh, marvelous Marvin Hagler. And Tony said, we're going. I thought, Las Vegas, Caesar's Palace, how do we arrange that? Tony had it down. 
Here's what we're going to do. Steve, you're going to go to the Metro Times and get press passes for me and yourself. <laughs> we're going to fly to L.A. We're going to meet up with my old friend. John was his name, as I recall. John will have a bag of weed. We'll all reread Hunter Thompson's Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas as our guide. <laughs> but with a change of script, where we stayed? Tony's mom's house, which was a ranch house <laughs> off of the strip. Uh, and it worked. Uh, this was a wonderful moment, and it even had a, a, an improbable bonus, which was that Tony, again, looking at what was possible and having a much better grip on it than I did, he said, here's what we're going to do tonight, the day before the fight. We're going to go to Jake LaMotta's wedding reception. <laughs> Jake LaMotta, Raging Bull. You might have seen Robert De Niro play the lead role. He was getting married for the sixth time. Tony went into the room, and, and as many people have described, he had a wonderful way of just breaking the ice and talking with anyone, and he strides right up to LaMotta, introduces himself and his mom, <laughs> and, and then for the next 10 minutes is talking to Jake and his new model wife. It was, a, it was something only in, uh, Tony could have engineered. Um, the Metro Times, by the way, did run our article, and, <laughs> and Tony's byline was Riverboat Rothschild. Which is apt, because he did like to gamble. <clears throat> In moderation, of course. Uh, let me tell a last story um, that captures how Tony's love of sports uh, merged with, merged with uh, the love of his family. Uh, I was happy to be there uh, for a special moment in the last weeks of his life in East Hampton, Massachusetts, where many of his friends had a chance to visit one last time. And you've heard already, um, and some, for some of you there, you know what it was like. Uh, what an amazing environment that was, uh, and you can imagine it based on, if you weren't there, based on what you've heard already. But in mid-December, uh, part of what was this wonderful mixture of love and humor and a sort of unblinking openness about what was going on was that Lindsay arranged for a very special moment. It was referred to earlier uh, tonight. She, she arranged for a very special surprise, a phone call to Tony from one of his heroes, Alan Trammell. And taking the call on speakerphone, Nancy and I were there, so we were privileged to hear this exchange, because Tony was right away already at ease and talking amiably with Alan Trammell, who was actually more tongue-tied than Tony. Tony, not at all. <laughs> Trammell, understandably, here's a stranger who he's never met who's talking about how he's dying of an incurable disease. But then they got into stride, and all of a sudden, they're talking about trade deadlines and rosters and schedules and baseball history, and Tony's talking about the Pacific Coast League, and immediately Trammell picks up on that because he also grew up in California, so they're just recalling this, way, this incredible range of information in this sort of casual, friendly manner. Uh, and at the end of it, Trammell said how much, how amazed he was by Tony's recall, and we all were. Let me just finish by recalling two things, actually Tony's last, first and last words to me during our visit. They'll stay with me forever. In the first minutes after Nancy and I arrived, Tony told me that he wasn't afraid of dying, as if to put me at ease, and it was really welcome, because I'm wondering what to say to my friend under these, these circumstances. And he immediately made it clear, we're going to talk honestly about it, and without fear of what it means to be dealing with this kind of circumstance. And then as we left, three days later, uh, Tony came to the door, and it was really very moving. He's, he talked about, for him, his, uh, his understanding now, all the deeper, of the power of love. And his words were, to feel it and to say it. So Tony, Mona, Lindsay, Xander, Drea, Sasha, we love you. I think it's an appropriate time for all of us to, to get in the mood to sing Take me out to the ball game. Julie, can you lead us? Please stand, yeah, and sing with gusto. We're going to sing it two times through. Take me out to the ball game. Take me out to the crowd. Buy me some peanuts and cracker jacks. I don't care.
can have this many amazing stories told about them is pretty phenomenal. So the stories are wonderful, and it, and it seems that they're endless in Tony's case because he was, he was so wonderful. And one of the things that he and I both, a lot of times the stories are so painful because they're of, you know, when we were involved in political moments that might have been, oh my God, did that really happen kind of thing. And both of us shared the phenomenal experience of running and being elected to a board of education, which of course had amazing, phenomenal, cataclysmic and other adjectives um, experiences. But, but I always admired him, and he, he was president of his board of education in Lake Orion. I mean, what an achievement that was. In. But those are the kind of things that, there's so many things like that that Tony did um, that add to this resume and this chronology. But Mona, I know you laughed many times at the things that were going on in the political realm. I mean, and they were pretty phenomenal. So that was something I wanted to point out. But right now, uh, we, we want to hear from uh, Kay Halonen, and she's going to talk with, us, talk with us. She was a supervisor at VISTA, and when they were together in VISTA, and VISTA, as you recall, I said, it's part of AmeriCorps, which is like the, peace, the domestic Peace Corps. And it was one of the first programs when AmeriCorps was established uh, long, long ago in the 50s or 60s. But anyway, please come forward. Thank you. A lot of stuff is being repeated. I will try not to do that. But one of the things that became clear in what everybody's been saying today is that Tony used words. And he used his words to do networking, to build combinations of people, little groupings of people that met other little groupings of people. And he used his words to tell jokes, to cast, I remember him calling a bingo game, which was a great love of mine coming from Finnish background, and all the old people would play bingo and say, uksi, goxi, gola, mavis. He did not do that. He said, one, be one, two, one, whatever. Um, and he spoke truth. As Steve just mentioned, he spoke truth from the heart, and he spoke truth to how our society runs. And he organized for social change. My name is Kay Hallonen, and I met Tony and Mona in 1970 when they came to Detroit as VISTA volunteers. We met at St. Patrick's Catholic Church on Parsons Street, just up from the old, what once raggedy orchestra hall that is now absolutely beautiful and gorgeous. Um, and uh, I had been hired by Father uh, O'Hara and the community board of the, for the position of neighborhood VISTA supervisor. Wow, I said to myself, as Tony immediately become, came up to say, hello, how are you? Um, I'm glad to be here. And meanwhile, I saw some of the other VISTAs kind of backing off, wondering what have they gotten into here? Here's, this, here's this, this neighborhood with a beautiful church in it and a, and a neglected orchestra hall and Tony already feeling completely comfortable. At the back of the group, I noticed Mona, who I also called um, a Tona and Moni often. It came out of my mouth because they were so linked together. Um, and she was, she was doing what I now know to be a series of quick ball changes and, and, and uh, some twirls. And I thought... Oh, okay, and I thought, I learned really quickly that Mona was a dancer, and a very good dancer. And I, I, were, I really appreciated Mona and her dancing. Is it Sam, my husband Sam and I are, are amateur folk singer people, and uh, not, too, not too cool and hip on the modern music, but we know the old stuff, we, we know that stuff. And I saw Mona when we were at social events, when we were in, in community uh, settings. Sam and I would be singing, and Mona could actually hear the beat, she heard the rhythm, and she actually heard the music. And she danced, and I said, dang, I guess we do make music. And it was a, re it was a really rewarding thing. The VISTA program was initiated as a U.S. Domestic Peace Corps, which you just heard. And Detroit's cast Trumbull communities were among the most diverse in terms of ethnicity and, and age, and the, two of the poorest communities in Detroit in terms of jobs, skills, and access to public services. The assumption in Washington, D.C., which is often the, the truth with people who fund some of these programs, is that communities like ours really could not take care of ourselves. And what we need are college-educated, smart people from outside the community to do for us what we could not do for ourselves. Wrong. That is a completely wrong concept of how communities organize, what communities do, and how communities operate. And what happened then, we, we, what we wanted were people that would come into the community that actually could work with us 
that we would give each other mutual leadership. One person, one grouping was not smarter than the other, but we worked together to realize some of the programs we had worked so hard on. And for the most part, the vistas that came into Detroit in 1970 were absolutely wonderful in terms of being willing to learn what needed to be learned in order to, and, and be willing to share what could be shared. In the process, we all became different people at the end of this process. Uh, it was wonderful working on St. Patrick's. We had a lot of support, and it was wonderful, especially working with the community that already existed and produced its own leaders, and now we had some forces to be even more effective. Tony and Mona were assigned to work with the Cass Methodist Church, which was just down the street, uh, and a food buying club. Tony became a chauffeur. He drove the food bus um, out to Eight Mile, which is quite a distance from where, we, where that neighborhood was, and he had, had to get a chauffeur's license to drive the bus. And the reason that, that Tony ended up driving that far to get food was because just three years later, the year I had come to Detroit from Seattle, there had been the, the 1967 rebellion. And many of the stores that had been there, and there were, there were not a lot, there were a few, but the ones that were there had been burned down. So the distance was necessary to pick up the food and operate more like a cooperative and a collective. Um, then in the evening, Tony and Mona would go to the Wonder Bread store, that nice white Wonder Bread. It was, it was pretty, it was in a pretty package, but then able to, to give out uh, food, uh, bread to people in the next morning and be able to make sure that somebody has some kind of nourishment. The main thing was a development of empowerment, an idea that you don't have to settle for less, even though much of the community and the city looks at you as less. Tony, uh, the VISTA program ran for two years in Cass Trumbull community. In 1972, the program was moved to the Unitarian Universalist Church at Cass and Forest. And in most, in most communities, so the, the, the two-year contract, that the initial VISTAs that I had the, the, the pleasure of working with, uh, were done. And usually what happened in those VISTA programs, because it was, the, it, was a, it was an attempt to help those who couldn't help themselves, many people from our VISTA group stayed. And it was really a remarkable um, outcome because by that time we had started to generate a, a, a style and a way of working that actually uh, made us into buddies and friends. We'd gone beyond the normal B VISTA program. And what ended up happening was that Tony and Mona stayed in Detroit for their lives. And uh, I think the original plan, as Mona told me, was that Tony was going to go to Brandeis and study economics. Instead, he went to U of M Ann Arbor and studied, um, so I took social work, looking at how to fund socially um, um, productive organizations. That was to our, to our great joy that they stayed, our great joy that Tony stayed. Um, of equal importance, Tony had, oh God, you've heard this all that he could talk to anybody. He really could talk to anybody. And he built these networks uh, that allowed him to work for Councilman uh, Mel Ravitz and co later Congressman uh, George Crockett. He also became an organizer of things to do. Uh, you just heard about the, the baseball thing and that, you know, the, the tours and all that, but things to do. And he did it directly in a very personal way, he and Mona both. And I remember Mona and Tony, I don't know quite how this happened, but you ended up taking, him, taking my kids, who were young then, uh, to a really scary movie. A really scary movie. And so for the next three nights, as they couldn't get to sleep, I thought, thanks, Tony and Mona, you guys are wonderful. <laughs> I also, I also remember um, going, a trip to West Virginia where we, we were listening to Appalachian Southern music. And uh, I think Emily went with you and uh, uh, our daughter Simone came with us. And then one of Emily's consistent stories is how you took her to see Blondie. Well, as I said, we were folk music people. We didn't know who Blondie was. Who was talking about Lady Gaga and uh, Susan? Yeah. I mean, well, who are you talking about? So I remember Emily, went, you took it as a graduation gift, and she felt really happy that you were taking her. The one thing is, she, because she lived with us, she did not know what the style was for, uh, for Blondie. So she put on her most beautiful, lovely pantsuit and went walking in with this funny smells in this auditorium and, you know, the music that she didn't understand. And to this day, I think she's very grateful for that experience, but I do think she probably wishes, Mom, couldn't you have told me what to do so I could look right? But those kind of intimacies, it wasn't just a matter of networking to get things done, but, we, uh, but it, was a matter, it was a matter of getting to know each other's families. Um, Ma, Tony lived fully. He lived completely. 
And I think sometimes he made people annoyed, and sometimes he made people very happy. And as he's, like a, he's like a real person. Tony is a real person with all our flaws and all our, our wonderful peculiarities and all our wonderful assets. And, and I, I think that he, 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 he communicated fully without, without um, a reservation, and he, 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 he always had action in mind to do something. Was it fun? Was it political? To do something, to accomplish something. And I can't tell you how totally grateful we are, Mona, Lindsay, Xander, and the whole, all your family, for sharing them with us. Uh, you, 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 you brought, you as a family brought a source of life into our, our, our existence that would not have otherwise, and, and um, could we have owned it? I'm struggling for words, but I'm trying to find the right ones, and they, they, they're coming sometimes, and they go away uh, in my head. Um, in closing, what I'd like to do is to read a poem from uh, the eight year, uh, he was eight when he wrote this poem. Eight year old grandson of Cass Quarter leadership, Fran and Pat Dorn, who any of the Vistas would know, any of the ex Vistas would know very much. Because I think this is what Tony was trying to tell us sometimes. What well, Sebastian Dorn, who was when eight when he wrote this, he said, if we didn't have words, our world would be the universe with mysteries of life without death, time, or space. And if we didn't have words, how am I supposed to say I'm sorry or even write this poem? So I think Tony would like that. So that's to Tony, to you. Thank you. We love you all. I'm very privileged to be able to share something with you that I'm going to read uh, because they are, the persons who wrote them were, are not able to be here, but this, these are so beautifully written. I know you'll feel the love for Tony. Uh, the first is from Tessa Calejo. She says... Let me first express my deepest condolences to Mona, Tony's children and grandchildren, the extended family and friends who are gathered to celebrate his life and mourn his passing. And by the way, this is when they worked with George Crockett, who ironically lives in the same house on Nicolette Street that I live in on Joliet. I'm sorry. What? There's another script, you mean? Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Okay, we're back. Thank you, thank you, thank you. She's done an incredible job, by the way. Just phenomenal, phenomenal, phenomenal. Really. Okay, here we go. Now, um, says, I first met Tony in 1988 on a delegation I led to El Salvador, this is from Tessa, to observe their first free elections since the 1930s. I was director of the Central American Refugee Organizing Project, and Tony was special assistant to Congressman George Crockett, who had recently become the chairman of the House Committee on the Western Hemisphere. Representative Crockett was a staunch opponent of Ronald Reagan's President Reagan's policy in Central America, which included propping up a corrupt government and the army of El Salvador. Tony traveled to El Salvador on multiple occasions, multiple occasions, and I had the privilege of being with him there twice during the war. I wonder how many of his friends were aware of Tony's contributions to lifting up the human toll of the war in El Salvador and building U.S. support for a negotiated settlement to the conflict that lasted 12 years and claimed more than 75,000 civilian lives. I witnessed firsthand his courage and commitment. Tony traveled to Central America in a dangerous time to do what he could to bring an end to, U to a U.S.-supported war that was claiming thousands of lives and displacing Salvadorans to refugee camps in Honduras or to the United States seeking political asylum. Tony not only understood the history and context of U.S. involvement in Central America, but he was always, but he was a compassionate presence to the people we met. We traveled into conflictive zones after the election and took testimony of refugees who had returned to their villages after being displaced years before by scorched earth policies. His empathy and ability to connect with Salvadorans struggling to survive impressed me then and we stayed in touch over the next few years. We found ourselves again in El Salvador in 1990, soon after six Jesuits and their housekeeper and daughter were murdered 
by the Salvadoran Army on the Central American University campus. We were part of an emergency delegation to investigate and document a Salvadoran Air Force attack on a civilian community in a village. Six people died, five of them children, and 20 people were wounded. Tony and I, along with Bishop Thomas Gumbledon and others, attempted to travel to the site of the bombing, but were stopped by the military on the road. They told us they were protecting us from the rebel forces, the FMLN, and that they would not let us go to see the site or meet with the village inhabitants for our own safety. As the hours progressed, the standoff continued. The women from the village joined us on the road, urging us to find a way to reach our destination and see for ourselves the physical evidence of what had happened. Tony communicated on our behalf with the embassy and the military command. We were ultimately granted permission for a short, village, short visit to the village, thanks in part to Tony. When we saw what, we, when, what we saw when we arrived was devastating. Three buildings, including a child care center, were totally destroyed. We found shrapnel with the words, made in the U.S., and gathered this evidence of the bombing and the stories of the people who lost their loved ones in the attack. What I remember is how Tony so adeptly stepped into his role of representing a U.S. congressperson, someone who could bring to light the real impact of our country's military and economic aid in El Salvador. What stood out for me was Tony's empathy, his courage, and his humility. He not only represented a U.S. congressperson and our movement seeking to end the war, but he also walked with the people, suffering the toll of torture disappearances and massacres. He was both a witness and a voice for peace, bringing the voice of the voiceless into the political climate in the U.S. Tony helped to stop U.S. support for a war that ravished the small country and displaced hundreds of thousands of Salvadorans. I am thankful to have known him, to have traveled with him in El Salvador, and to have witnessed his many contributions May we always remember Tony and support his family and all that he held dear. And that was from Tessa Calejo. It's phenomenal. <clears throat> uh, this is from Bill Jones from NSO. In my remembrance of Tony, with whom I worked back in the 70s in Detroit, what comes to mind first is an insightful Maya Angelou quote which says, I've learned that people will forget what you said, people for will forget what you did, but people will never forget how you made them feel. So when I think of Tony Rothschild, the first thing I can say is that he had the rare ability to make everyone feel valued. Even though decades have passed since my wife and I left Ann Arbor, losing contact with Tony and Mona, the overriding feeling he left within me is that he was warm and generous and that he, can, he genuinely cared about me and everyone who came into his orbit. I had never seen anyone like Tony who was so laser focused on making things better for everyone else. At the Neighborhood Service Organization, NSO, as community organizers, Tony and I embraced projects large and small all with the intent to strengthen the neighborhood and its people during the post-summer of 67 in Detroit. For one such project, we were tasked to write a comprehensive citywide program for families and youth, emphasizing everything from job training to youth recreation. Now, we all know what a smart guy Tony was, but I think his greatest assets were his sense of humor and perceptive nature. That is, his ability to spot BS a, a, and, sorry, I lost my voice. His ability to spot BS a mile away. That's he did. That's true. I'm thinking now about one specific project when our team of five or six people were given topics to write about for this comprehensive program. Tony and I were assigned to work together on our topic, the title of which I do not remember. But I do remember that Tony knew me well enough to recognize that I was, at that young age, a skilled procrastinator. <laughs> Throughout the writing process, Tony would occasionally say to me in that non-judgmental way, well, Bill, never do today what you can put off until tomorrow. 
To this day, the humorous irony of Tony's gentle jabs guides my conscience, and I have lost much of my, quote, super procrastinator skill. Thank you, Tony. So now, upon further reflection, I realize that Ms. Angelou's words of wisdom don't ring completely true about my memories of Tony and me at the NSO. The truth is, when words were spoken by a man with such a benevolent spirit, I do remember them and the feeling of love they left in me. Although my story is just a small part of the long life of my friend Tony Rothschild, I'm sure that everyone who had the good fortune to know him has a similar warm story or more to tell about their relationship in this one-of-a-kind human being. My wife Natasha and I regret not being able to connect with Tony and Mona in Columbus last summer on their amazing RV journey, but we will stay connected to his memory and his family from this point forward. Rest in peace, Tony. Bill Jones. Tony had a lifelong uh, relationship with the University of Michigan and the School of Social Work in particular. Uh, he uh, was brought in uh, while he was at Common Ground to the University of Michigan as a CEO in residence, emphasizing the real life working experiences of social workers. Uh, from there, he became uh, an associate professor teaching one class a semester for four years. Uh, Tony taught uh, macro uh, social work, which emphasizes advocacy, administration, and organizing. And uh, every, it was a required class for everybody in the School of Social Work. Uh, at one time, just to prove uh, the point that you're an organizer uh, all your life, he brought in three people in their 80s, uh, Selma Good, Ethel Schwartz, and Helen Sandberg, to talk with the students. They were all in their, in their 80s uh, and, and 90s. Uh, unfortunately, Helen passed away before she was able to make a presentation to the class, but the others did. And his point was that, uh, it, that social work is a passion, organizing is a passion that you can keep with you all of your life. And we have today uh, two people from the social, School of Social Work. Okay, Barry and, uh, and a fellow student uh, uh, who, uh, who Tony taught, Alana Napo, and uh, so I'll introduce Barry and Alana. Thank you, I'm Alana Napo. I had Tony as a professor uh, circa 2010, 2011, and I just wanna tell you a little bit about what it was like to be in Tony's classroom. So it wasn't just a class, it was an experience, as you can all, I'm sure, imagine from what you've heard. Um, Tony just created such, warmth and uh, he he was very knowledgeable and also an absolute goofball and um, and and everyone knew him as not just Professor Rothschild not Professor Tony but Tony he was like one of those one named artists that needs no um, <laughs> introduction so so there was this sense of camaraderie amongst all the students that you just don't see uh, in other academic settings and his class was really a blast and and who says that about grad school right so it, it was really important I think that he had such a clear understanding of um, how to aid people with mental health issues because no one needs that more than social work grad students and um, I say that with absolute seriousness so um, he was the kind of kind of goofball that would say something and the students would look at each other and say like did he really just say that and and then and we came to realize each time yes he he really just said that and um i think that was really an important um escape but also of course an incredible experience of knowledge and learning with his wealth of um real life um his, his real life accomplishments, and, and I will say he was so understated, I had really barely a hint of his accomplishments through his own, um, you know, talking about it as a professor as compared to what I'm learning here today. So um, I think every day was an eye opener to his students about what advocacy and community organizing could be and what we could, really could achieve. and. Um, that I think that was really important for everyone in his class. So um, it was an important journey, and I think no one could walk us through it better than Tony. 
Thank you. So it's a, it's a great pleasure for me to have been invited here. Thank you, Mona, for, for letting this happen. Um, and it's been a pleasure just to listen to people talking about Tony. And it makes me think that um, there's probably no way to, to sort of start to sum this up. But in the same way as Alana described Tony in the classroom, I guess what I would say is, is that at heart, Tony was a real minch. There was no one. <laughs> he, was, he was a person who was fun to be around. He was loving. He loved other people. Everyone knew it. But he also was a role model. He was someone that you wanted someone in your family to marry. <laughs> and, um, and so that's the first word that I would use as I kind of think about what people have been saying today. The other, the other term, which I haven't heard, is social justice. Tony had a lifelong commitment to social justice. It was what he, it was how he thought, it was the lens through which he saw the world, it is who he was. And when I first met Tony, I saw him to be a mensch almost immediately, and I knew that he was a social justice person forever, and we wanted him to come to the U of M and teach students. We also knew that his winning style, um, you had to, he was engaging people. He was able to engage people and pull them in. Um, but he was very sophisticated in what he knew how to do. And he knew how to think about things. And I think what I would say is, is that among the ways that he thought, some of you who are social workers will, will recognize his, how Tony would fit into a curriculum. One, he was an organizer. He was born an organizer. He was a natural organizer, whether he was in the building or, uh, or in the community. He knew, he thought like an organizer. Next, he was an advocate. He was an activist to be sure, but more than an activist, he was an advocate. He had very strong social, po social values. He knew that they should become policies and he was able to use his skills as an advocate. And then finally, as many of you know him, he was a wonderful administrator, a manager. There were people who worked for Common Ground who I still see as former students of ours. They absolutely loved him. Uh, he endeared them to him. But he never really tried to do that because he was such a self-effacing person that it was very deceptive in all of the talk about baseball and sports and fun. Tony was a very sophisticated person. Um, just a word, I met him after um, we had come here and he had recently left working for George Crockett. Um, I knew immediately that this was someone who could introduce me to the Detroit metropolitan area, which he did. He introduced me to Marianne Mahaffey. He introduced me to Mel Ravitz. He introduced me to so many people. I always, he was always a go-to person for me, and it was just a great joy to have him uh, on, on our side. We were privileged at the U of M that he accepted to come and to teach social work. It wasn't just for everything that he knew, but it was also, he was a terrific teacher. People wanted to take his course. He gave them something that they were not getting from, they were looking for from other people, but they weren't able to find it in the Ann Arbor campus. 
He was among our most popular teachers in the time that he was with us. And when a foundation enabled him to come and spend a whole year with us, it was absolutely wonderful for all of us because he also got to come to meetings and be on committees with us, which he somehow enjoyed doing. And he really, he brought something very, very special to that. But the final thing that I would just say about Tony was, in addition to being an organizer, his was a lifelong commitment to social and political action. We don't find that very much in social work today, but he represented someone with extensive experience and a deep commitment to social and political action, and we couldn't have found anyone better than Tony to, to join us. He will be very missed. Um, people at Michigan still talk about him. We have former students who still talk about him. I wish you were going to be with us this coming semester. Thank you. Thank you, Alana and uh, Barry. Uh, those of you who were at uh, Tony's retirement party uh, from Common Ground remember the presentation, I'm sure, of Anthony Grupito, a young man uh, who is going to talk to, the, to, to us today about how his life was changed by his encounter with Tony and with Common Ground. Anthony? Hey, guys. <laughs> this is as awkward as, uh, as I thought it would be, so. <laughs> My name's Anthony Grappito, 23 years old and from Lake Orion, Michigan. Um, when I was 18, uh, or let's jump back a little bit. When I was in high school, I had a lot of problems uh, that brought me to Common Ground. And when I was 18, I decided to build a magic show that would educate people about mental health, suicide prevention, and anxiety by sharing my own story. And um, no one would hire me for this, so naturally I got in a car, drove to Las Vegas where I lived in a, in a car and I'm inside of motels and things, and I street performed. Uh, for a living, trying to spread awareness and build this show. Uh, an article was written about me and um, someone that Tony worked with. Uh, I don't know if she's here, but Reggie Harrison. Okay, so she's not here. A girl named Reggie Harrison saw this and uh, brought me to Common Ground where I met Tony. And he helped me develop a very unique uh, presentation um, and a metaphor using a straight jacket and 40 feet of chain. So, this talk has developed a lot. <laughs> you guys are giving me the weirdest faces, some of you. <laughs> so, I'm a magician, so maybe I should have started with that. That's what I do. This is what I do for a living. So, <laughs> the presentation has changed a lot. Uh, it went from just being five minutes with my involvement at Common Ground and with Tony um, to an hour long presentation that I do uh, solely for a living now. So, um, Let's jump back. I'm 23 now. Let's jump back four or five years. And um, Mona asked that I shared the presentation uh, that I would give at Common Ground for fundraisers, for their legacy breakfast, and then eventually at Tony's uh, retirement party, which was at the beautiful Gem Theater, for those of you uh, who are there. So, uh, yeah. <sighs> Let me reintroduce myself. My name's Anthony Grappito from Lake Orion, Michigan. When I was in fifth grade, I got bullied so bad that I had to move schools. And I took that out of myself for the first time with a pair of scissors and self-harm. I went to a private school where I learned absolutely nothing about mental health, and then into high school where I continued to learn nothing about mental health. I never thought about the self-harm uh, being a reaction to my stress or the way that things were going. In my junior year of high school, I was on a 20-match win streak wrestling at the Silver Dome. I was up seven points in the second period, and I chose the down position. When I went to stand up, my opponent took me straight back, slamming me on my head and tearing both of the rotator cuffs in my shoulders. I learned very quickly that my injuries were so bad that I would never be able to wrestle again. And because of these injuries and me not being able to wrestle again, I found out that the full ride scholarship I had for college would be taken away from me because I was no longer of any value or worth to an organization that I dedicated my entire life to. My mother at the time was out of a job because she worked on a psych ward, and a patient had broken the mirror in the phone room and attacked her. 
My dad also that year had lost his job and a lawsuit, putting us very in debt, and he told me, I'm sorry about your sports scholarship, but it's fair that you know now that you won't be getting an academic uh, scholarship either. Uh, we're too in debt for me to file for my taxes, so they can't base my income off anything. And um, I don't have any advice for you. Being a 16-year-old, I was extremely pissed off. And the three people that I went to for help didn't know anything about mental health, so things were getting worse. Instead of using drugs or alcohol, my outlet to deal with this stress um, was self-harm. I didn't have correct diet and exercise because I was a wrestler who cut weight and I was extremely injured. And so every single morning when I woke up, I would harm myself. And this would happen in school, after school, and it was my sense of release and sense of control. But just like any other negative coping skill that we would use, it stopped working and I no longer felt anything at all. I simply became an empty shell that existed. And I didn't do it for attention because seven months of my life went by and not a single person knew about it. Unfortunately, because of this skill no longer work, or because of this negative coping skill no longer working and making things worse, I attempted suicide. Not once, not twice, but on three different occasions. And I would walk through my front door and see my parents who knew nothing about it and sit with my classmates the next day in school and my best friends who knew nothing about it. It wasn't until I came to school one day without my sleeves on that somebody saw and went to the school counselor and they asked, what happened? They didn't ask what was wrong with me, but they asked, what happened to you? And that's where the conversation started. I was brought to common ground uh, to be assessed as an inpatient and then uh, re related over to Oakland Family Services for outpatient therapy. I had to relearn how to cope with stress and trauma and to get hold of my mental illness that is depression that runs in my family. A lot of people get confused as to why I get tied up in a straitjacket and 40 feet of chain to say to these things to you. That's because this is how I felt every day. I felt claustrophobic, I felt trapped, and I felt like there was absolutely nothing I could do to stop the pain. But in therapy, I learned that a lot of our issues are only there because we allow them to be. And what I mean by that is just by taking a deep breath in like this, and letting it go. I free all that, all that extra weight that I carry. See, the chains were an illusion. They were never tight around me, but they stayed on my body and weighed me down simply because I allowed them to. And that's something that we do to ourselves every day. We convince ourselves that we have these problems and we carry this weight. But just by taking a deep breath and letting it go, it drops. Now, if those problems come back to face you one day, you can look at them head on and face them when they're real. But step two is a lot harder, mainly because I'm in a straitjacket. Step two is working things up <laughs> Ouch. and over your head, which is easier if you're not wearing a suit and it puts you in the dark it makes you look back at life <laughs> but you got to keep looking forward and let the little things slide by sorry for this <laughs> because when things get most painful <laughs> that's how you know you're almost out So take it from me, I'm a magician, and I've never fooled a person in my whole life. What I mean by that is that the brain fools itself, and it's something that we do to ourselves every single day. Um, Tony Rothschild was uh, an amazing influence in my life. When I was 18, I was, uh, I was a lot different. I was, <laughs> I was pretty messed up, and uh, I can admit that. But he saw something in me that made me the person that I am today. And following just the actions and the words that he spoke and that he used it really influenced and, and changed my life. So whether you know this, your, your husband, your dad, and, every, and everyone is someone that I carry with me in my presentations all the time. I don't know how nobody's cried up here yet. <laughs> I guess it might just be me. But um, the, the meaning of my work 
when I tell people to be careful with the words that they say. Uh, by saying abracadabra, it means what I speak is what I create. And every single day, Tony, Tony did that. He created positivity, he created change, and created, it just influenced so many people. And uh, someone that, you know, I'll, I'll remember every single day for the rest of my life. So it's an honor that you guys had me speak here. And uh, I think what makes a man isn't the individual, but the people who support him. And the, it's, there's so much love in this room. So. That was a wonderful show and tell, right? Congratulations, that was awesome. Uh, now we have a special, another special treat. We're going to have colleagues from Common Ground who worked with Tony come and t tell us a little bit more about him. Uh, Vicki Krigner, Rose Gaddis, and Kay White. Hello. As I uh, prepared for today, I uh, decided I needed help. This isn't something I can do on my own. So I wrote, uh, I sent an email to some of my coworkers and I asked them, I told them what I was you know, gonna be doing, and I asked them to share their ideas and thoughts about Tony with me so that I could bring them to you, to share with you. And uh, Colleen shared her story, oh, glasses, excuse me, <laughs> shared that when she had first joined Common Ground, she had been recently widowed and had a young son. When Tony met her and became aware of her situation, he took her son under his wing, taking him to Tiger Games and introducing him to the opera and to just taking an interest in his well-being. The other note shared a common thread. Tony took an interest in the staff of Common Ground. He knew your name. He took the time to know you personally. He treated everyone with respect and made you feel valued, not just as an employee, but as a person too. Several people commented on how he encouraged them to grow not only in their personal life, but also in their education. Words that were used to describe Tony included unique, leader, compassionate, caring, welcoming, fair, genuine, and the list went on. I'll close by reading a quote from Kim's email that truly encompasses our feelings for Tony. His willingness to share his authentic self and experiences great experiences as well as not so great experiences, planted seeds of knowledge that continue to blossom and beckon strength, as well as a perspective that life's circumstances are not hopeless avenues encountered along our often mundane journey, but rather opportunities to be better, do better, and pay it forward. Tony seemed to model this so effortlessly he was a teacher that continued to teach, a comforter that continued to console, our Facebook before Facebook. <laughs> he is and will always be missed and definitely never forgotten. Tony is the common ground that brought so many people, ideas, and opportunities together. It's a legacy of hope that is everlasting. Thank you all for having me here. And thank you, all of you. So I'm uh, Vicki Krigner, and I actually had the pleasure of working with Tony for over 20 years at Common Ground. And uh, Tony's, the big thing that he did in my mind is he created Common Ground like a family. Um, my very first thing I remember is uh, he, they had a, a wedding anniversary, and I sometimes say, um, don't, don't say Tony and Mona either, it's a Tona and Moni, <laughs> so it seems to be a habit people have. But anyways, they had a 25th wedding anniversary at their home and they invited all the staff. And um, it was incredible because I remember I got to play guitar and we, were, we did the song um, In My Life by the Beatles. And to this day, anytime I hear that song, it reminds me of them. Tony had a morning ritual at the office. Again, back to his connectivity with people, he would walk the halls of our administration building. He would talk to every single person that he saw. He was able to make a connection with every single person 
in the organization. He remembered little things about people so he could continue to have that conversation. Um, he also had that uncanny ability to connect people. Um, he was always trying to see who could, he could connect with who to create a better world. Uh, I even spoke with him during his last days and he told me he was trying to do that at the hospital. He was trying to connect the administrator at the hospital to his RV so he could get it sold. <laughs> so, um, he, he always did that. And, and Tony had the ability to make everyone feel like they were his best friend. It, it, I don't know if, care if you knew him one minute or 20 years like I did. Everyone feels like you're his best friend. His leadership style was also very inclusive and he saw the good in everybody and everything. He truly was the eternal optimist. His way of improving things at Common Ground was not to, to look at himself and say, oh, what can we do? It was really to see where are good things happening out in the world. Let's go visit them and then steal their ideas, bring them back and, and tweak them and make them work for Common Ground. And he, every, everything he did, he did for trying to enrich the lives of the people that we serve and people in the world. Um, Tony was also big on collaboration which seems to be the theme you know, uh, around here too. He, was, he loved to bring people together to solve problems. So in 2010, he was in Washington, D.C. at the sabbatical uh, at the National Council. And that's when all the healthcare reform was being talked about. So he came back and the first thing he said was, we have to form a group to learn about how this healthcare reform is going to impact common ground uh, and the people that um, are in our community. So he brought in speakers and articles, and then he thought, because he's the great collaborator, oh, we can't do this alone, let's bring in other organizations. So he brought in Southwest Solutions, Neighborhood Service Organization, Oakland Family Services, and we learned about hot spotting and, and how to actually help people who are uh, struggling with medical conditions as well as mental health. Through that, formed a new organization called Partners for Health, and it's still in existence today. So. Tony's philosophy was, don't have people do things alone. Work together, you can make it stronger and come up with a better solution. Tony also shared his life with us. Uh, I not, didn't know anything about horse racing until I met Tony. And um, you know, he would sh always share the backstories about the horses, the trainers, the jockeys, and how he was probably the only kid in the world that learned math on the racetrack when he was growing up, you know. And um, he, he patiently waited, right, for the Triple Crown winner. You know, we would watch the, the Derby, the Preakness, the Belmont, and he would fly off to see that third race to wait for that Triple Crown winner. He finally got it. <laughs> so um, you, you couldn't help but be passionate and enthusiastic about the things that he cared about. It, it just was all about him. And... Um, Another thing that when you talk about baseball, if you think about on his, tw his 20th anniversary at Common Ground, the Detroit Tigers gave him his own jersey with his name and number on the back. And I remember how excited he was about that. Also, if you ever want to know what was important to Tony, you could walk in his office and you'd see all of his Tiger, or any baseball, memorabilia on his windowsills. You'd see pictures of his family everywhere. You'd also see artwork, pictures that he had taken while he was visiting Xander in Bluefields or Kathy in Costa Rica, and he had um, a high yellow back chair. Those were like his treasured possessions. So when he retired, he knew I really loved one of his photos that he had taken. And I don't know if it was from a visit with Kathy in Costa Rica or Xander in Nicaragua, but it was uh, a black and white of the ocean and a, a bird in it. And he gave that to me as uh, his going away present to me was that, along with a nice base clock that he got at Art in the Park. But uh, that hangs in my home now, so every time I see it, I think of him. And then the high back yellow chair is at my daughter's house. So every time we're there, you know, his memory lives on there as well. The last thing is, you know, we worked together for over 20 years. You get really close to people in that time. I mean, Mona would call me his work wife and um, because we spent so much time together. And I talked to him, it was the day, the day of the Trammell phone call, and you know, he called because he wanted to make sure that everything that was said needed to be said, that there were no regrets. He was taking care of everyone that he could before he was no longer here. 
uh, he had, that's what he said, I want no regrets. He said, is there anything we need to you know, clear the air or anything? And I'm like, nope, we're good. And um, so then he said, you know, I'm really fortunate. Uh, he said, I've lived a full life, the best life that anyone could probably ever live. And if I cry, I'm sorry. <laughs> he said, I had a wonderful opportunity to grow and lead, you know, the wonderful organization, Common Ground, you know, for, he was there 25 years. He said, even his days of the Vista Volunteer, he loved and he learned so much along his path. He said he had owned a yacht. He had owned a racehorse, even if it was just the nose. It was still, he, he had owned, you know, the racehorse. He had traveled the globe, even though that's something he would have liked to have done more of. But more importantly, he had a wonderful family. Mona, Lindsay, Xander, Drea, Kathy, Patty, two wonderful grandchildren, Landale and Sasha, and he loved all of them very dearly. And he said to him that was the most important legacy that he would leave. And I personally feel very thankful and blessed to have been a part of his incredible journey. So thank you guys for sharing him with me. I was board chair in 1990 when Common Ground hired Tony Rothschild to be our new executive director. At that time, we had 20 employees, about 200 volunteers, a budget of slightly under $700,000, and we answered around 15,000 calls a year. I don't think that either Tony or I dreamed the changes he would make at Common Ground. But instead of moving on and finding a new job after a few years, Tony reinvented Common Ground on a regular basis. In 1995, Community Mental Health sought a dramatic change in services offered to Oakland County. Tony immediately recognized that, the only, that not only that whoever got that contract would be the main crisis service provider, but he also saw that we would not be in business if Common Ground did not get the contract. He knew that Common Ground would do the best job, and he made certain that that message got out. The psychiatric services, which are still the heart and the most important services of the, that the agency provides today, were there because he began these things and got that contract. Part of getting the contract was partnering with a hospital which provided the doctors and expertise. One of Tony's strengths was his genuine interest in working with others. When the sanctuary in Royal Oak was changing management, Tony immediately saw an opportunity because he knew that Common Ground needed to help more children in crisis. The merger went extremely well and continues to this day. When Tony learned about an opportunity for a sabbatical, he jumped on it and received from the McGregor Foundation a chance to do things like go to Guatemala and learn Spanish, but then he also learned about areas which would benefit Common Ground. His course at Harvard in not-for-profit management led to a discussion with the board about changing the agenda for our meetings. So now Common Ground's board meetings have very few committee reports and lots of energetic conversation about the future. One example that Tony brought in was a video about the lack of nutritional value in Hot Pockets. <laughs> it was very funny. But it also told the board that we were not feeding the people who were our clients very healthy food. The whole agency became involved in trying to eat better food with healthier outcomes. In the same way he believed in the merit of art therapy, he started the art therapy program in the uh, sanctuary and the crisis residential unit. And we got an extra there because Mona volunteered her talents to help with the program as well as she had already been helping with our legal clinic for many years. And throughout all of this, we had fun. Tony enthusiastically shared his interest in the opera, horse racing, and the Tigers by having the agency picnic at the Tigers game, as well as bringing in every new idea he was always on the lookout for. He had staff and board members play golf in the community mental health outing. We had a book club. Being board chair with Tony as CEO was always interesting and always felt by a partnership. I think one of the most honors that Tony wanted most of all 
came true when Common Ground was named Crane's Best Managed Not-for-Profit in, in 2014. It was an honor richly deserved. Tony had managed to manage for 24 years and had turned a tiny grassroots agency into one of serving about 80,000 people a year. We had a budget then of 13 million and we were, had 250 employees. He would say he didn't do it alone, but he assembled a great team and then was the spark that lit the fire of excellence in the agency. When Tony decided to retire, he did it like he did everything else. He was open and consulting with all. He was generous with advice, but then he left the rest of us to figure out what would be best for common ground. He looked for best practices and made sure Common Ground used them to find an able replacement. He left in the style with which he had had all during his tenure. He planned ahead, he included as many as possible, and he wanted only the best for all concerned. Tony left many legacies. One of his most important accomplishments is that every day Common Ground is in existence to help people move from crisis to hope. Right now we have contact with about 80,000 people a year. This number will keep growing, and it will keep growing because Tony Rothschild had a vision that Common Ground would, be not only, would not only survive, but it would be the best. And now and in the future, we are moving to crisis to hope because he was there. Thank you, Tony. That was wonderful to all three of you. Thank you so much. Uh, most of you would know this, um, but just in case you didn't, you know that Tony frequently attended opera. And I think you heard what was playing beautifully when we first came into the room this, this afternoon. And he very much enjoyed reading and listening to poetry. So now we're going to have a really wonderful treat. Uh, first, there's going to be a song by Alta Dantzlerk, accompanied by Dessa Stone, called In Solitario Stanza. And then we'll have a poem called Feeding the Birds by Joy Gaines Friedler. And then a song, Precious Friend, sung by Julie Butel.
Tony and I often talked about the idea of what you feed the world feeds you. So I wrote this poem called Feeding the Birds, and I dedicate it to the Scott Rothschild family. Feeding the Birds. First, you must love wings, feathers, the cautious heart, the way what is fragile perches on the soul. And for sure, you must want to keep things alive, the way history gives wings to time. Watch, you'll see the patterns, how the mighty win their place, feed their young that knowledge. You will see that blue jays bully cardinals, but grackles arrive ready to fight. You will learn about exile and return, exile and return. Eventually, feeding will become an obsession. And because our souls are shaped like hands, opening and closing on what we love, your garage will fill with suet sails, black oilers stored in metal containers, sugar water in the fridge. We are all small gods, our hearts fierce yet strangely weak. And here's the grip. When there is loss, or sorrow, they will feed you. Because when the rains come, even when the rains come, the birds feed, the birds sing. So this song is written by uh, Pete Seeger, and kind of hard to follow an opera singer. <laughs> My guitar's slightly out of tune. <laughs> Just when I thought I was lost, you changed my mind. You gave me hope, not just the old soft soap you showed that we could learn to share in time. You and me and Rockefeller will keep plugging on. Your face will shine through all of our tears. And when we sing another victory song, precious friend, you will be here. OK, you got it? You ready? Just when I thought all was lost, you change my mind just when I thought I was lost. You changed my mind. You gave me hope. You gave me hope. Not just the old soft soap you showed that we could learn to share in time. You and me and Jeffrey Bezos will keep plugging on. Your face will shine through all of our tears. And when we sing another victory song, precious friend, you will be here. Last time through, just when I thought, just when I all was lost. All was lost. You changed my mind. You changed. You gave me hope. You gave me not just the old soft so not just the old soft. You showed that we could learn to share in time. You and me and Rupert Murdoch will keep plugging on. Your face will shine. Your face will through all of our tears. All of our tears. When we sing another victory song, and when we sing another victory song, precious friend, you will be here singing in harmony, precious friend.
We want to thank everybody for sharing these stories and reminiscences and, and memories of Tony. You know, every time we saw Tony, we felt inspired, we felt energized, and he, we felt that we could be empowered. And that was Tony's gift to us. And uh, he may not be with us physically, but he's going to be with us for a long, long time. And uh, there are a couple of announcements that we wanted to make uh, in the program. Uh, one is that uh, if you have stories that you would like to share about Tony, please post them online at caringbridge.org or uh, send them to Mona at uh, monahelenescott at gmail.com. Those addresses are in your program. And uh, there is an opportunity to send photographs, too. If you have photos uh, of Tony uh, and the family and friends, uh, I'm sure that uh, we'd, love to, we'd love to share them. And you can send them, uh, as the program states, uh, to photosoftonyr at gmail.com. And finally, if you'd like to make donations in Tony's memory and tribute to Tony, there are a couple of organizations, uh, the Sky Foundation and Common Ground, both, and the addresses and directions on making donations are at the bottom of the last page of the program. Again, thank you very, very much for, for joining us today. Thanks, you, Dave. And also, I, I think the, you received or you will receive five by seven cards. You have them already? And let me say, as someone who lost a spouse 22 years ago, I know how much it means when people write little notes in a way that you can keep them. And so I know that Mona and Lindsay and, and everyone would be so thrilled to have, your, to have your pour out your heart about Tony on a card, on the email, on Caring Bridge, or wherever it's most appropriate. But please do it. Because sometimes it's easy to put that off and you say, well, I'll do it later, or oh, she already knows how I feel. But it's so comforting, Mona, I'm sure you're experiencing this already, just to read sweet things about your loved one. And I know it would mean the world to the whole family. So please accept our thanks for being such a great audience. Uh, we, had, we had such talent here today. It was just thrilling and very inspiring for me and I'm sure Dave as well. Thank you, everyone. Oh, now we have a real treat. We're going to hear from the family. That is so wonderful. Well, hello, everyone. First, I want to say thank you to each and every one of you for coming from the bottom of my heart. I want to thank Lori for being the organizer here. And, and Lindsay for being the point person in Massachusetts. I want to thank Dave and Penny for being MCs, and to each of you who have spoke or performed, thank you. I also want to thank uh, each of you who sent cards and notes and emails. It meant more than you can know, just as Penny was saying. I had them all up on the walls. Now they're all in albums and binders, and they'll keep filling. <laughs> Um, and I want to thank you to those who sent donations when we asked for donations to Tony's Marijuana Fund, <laughs> which really did help, and for specific items we learned about for others that would help him along the sad process of his illness. Love in all different forms. And also I want to thank those who came and visited as what we call our visitor train. While some might have found so many visits overwhelming, the Tony we all know was an extrovert. And he, therefore, was enlivened by all these visits. All of this outpouring of, lo outpouring of love sent meant so much to Tony and me and to our family. Tony's sister came and spent a month with us in November, and that was so important to Tony. Um, our daughter, um, Lindsay, and her family, Dre and Sasha, welcomed us to Massachusetts, the whole family part of the team. Lindsay and Drea are both invaluable strengths of support for us and now for me. They also provided a house for us just five houses away from them that made it such a seamless move. It had been an Airbnb, but now it's a rental house. Tony and I signed a lease with them to give Tony residency in Massachusetts to enable him to get his medical marijuana. 
<clears throat> Our son Xander was an invaluable source of strength also, and still is for me. And of course, his magical chicken soup, which if you might have seen on Caring Bridge, but so much more. He is such a calming influence. Both Lindsay and Xander carry parts of Tony that I expect I will continue to see. Lindsay has been so helpful to me in just getting things done. I mean, there's a lot of details I've had to take care of, and Lindsay got me going. And that's Tony. Tony got things done. I mean, even his illness, he wasn't going to waste time about it. Let's get it done. You know? <laughs> And, um, and Xander, the calmness which Tony used to give to me, Xander also gives to me. Today is day 48 without Tony. My sister Marty, who unfortunately, due to a reservation snafu, is not here, but <clears throat> she asked, how many days did you have with Tony? Isn't that a sweet thought? I finally did the math. We were married on June 21st, 1970, which meant that when he passed away on January 21st, 19, oh, 2019, um, we had been married 47 years, uh, 48 years and seven months exactly. And um, we met in January 1968, but the first date that we had a fixed up date in April, but the first date that we had where we fixed it up ourselves and that became the first of an endless series of dates, uh, was on July 19th, 1968. So if you count from that date, um, we were together for 18,091 days. <laughs> we met in January 1968 through friends. Tony was attending Arizona State University and I was attending San Diego State. But even before we met, we had independently already made plans to transfer to UC Irvine for our uh, last two years of college, and we were together from then on. Kathy told you about growing up with Tony in his childhood. Well, Tony and I were 19 and 20 when we met. <clears throat> we grew up together, really from that point to being adu young adults, to being adults, to being mature adults. When we came to Detroit as VISTA volunteers, we came of age together there, in here in Detroit. We learned a new perspective of the world, a new framework. Tony had been more, really a new, a, a new world view, if you will. Um, <clears throat> Tony's politics had been more developed when we were in college at UC Irvine, but for both of us, we got that new framework, uh, if you will. We learned. We, we learned about, read Lenin and Marx together. Uh, we learned both, both learned and internalized feminism and socialism. And we passed those on to our children, as so many of you have done. Uh, by the time, <coughs> when we first got married, we had a celebratory day where we went around to all the different agencies we had to go to to change my name to Mona Rothschild. And I was Mona Rothschild for five years. I was Mona Rothschild when I came here. And I still love that Rothschild guy, and by that time, my Rothschild daughter. But um, it just didn't feel like my name. And I thought, well, five years, you know? Either we'll get divorced and I'll want my name back. I did become a divorce attorney, you may recall. Or, <laughs> or we'll be together for 50 years, and then, I'll, you know, what's five out of 50 years? Um, and then when Xander was born, he was very, Tony was very supportive of my name change, and when Xander was born, he suggested that we give Xander my last name, since our first child carried his last name. That was his idea. Tony was a very stabilizing force for me, I think for all of us in our family, and I'm betting it was probably for a lot of you out there too, and people who aren't even here. Um, I think I will still hear his voice at times when I need it, reminding me to keep things in perspective. Um, Xander lives in the house, lived in the house with us while he was ill, and now still lives there with me for now. His family, um, his, that will change soon. His family, Patricia and Lundley, his wife Patricia and his stepdaughter Lundley are far away in Nicaragua. Uh, hopefully that will change sometime too. But fortunately, even though they were afar in Nicaragua, Tony and I had enough visits to Nicaragua 
that we were really able to have a relationship with Patricia and Linda Lee and to love them, and they loved him, and they miss him with us. So, Tony had Sasha as his grandchild in Massachusetts, but he also had his grandchild in Nicaragua, Linda Lee. Living in Massachusetts, Sasha provided a spark. Tony loved him so, he was very playful with Sasha, and he got lots of hugs from Sasha. But there's a reason. A couple of years ago, he told Sasha, don't hug me, it'll make me talk like a duck. <laughs> and Tony had a very good duck voice, and it would emerge as he was being hugged. T Tony liked to play the role that he was not a romantic. I remember snuggling up to him and Tony saying, and t snuggling up to Tony and saying to him, I'm so glad we found each other. So many of our friends are still looking. And Tony said, well, we probably would have found somebody else. <laughs> but he was romantic. My, my, <laughs> my friend Kristen, who is here, who knew him from Common Ground and the Art Experience, uh, commented that she remembered when he came into a meeting one day with a anniversary card that I had made for him, which was a many pages affair. And um, he took it around the table and showed it to everyone. everyone. Everyone could see all the pages. So he was romantic. And for my 70th birthday, he gave me a beautiful locket. And unfortunately, the chain broke today, and I refused to read anything into that. <laughs> but I'll get it fixed. Anyway, the locket, and he, he, um, he was ill at that time. It was December. My, birthday's in de my 70th birthday was in December. And he couldn't get out and go shopping. So he organized his family to help him. Of course, uh, he, got, he had already looked for lockets but hadn't found one. Kathy found one in, in uh, Northampton in a jeweler and took him pictures. But of course, he had to see it before he bought it. So they organized a ruse where I would think he was going to the um, Department of Motor Vehicles. <laughs> to get his Massachusetts driver's license, which he had really an intent to do, and he did do. But they told, his cousins said they were taking him to the Department of Motor Vehicles, when in fact they took him to the jeweler to look at my pretty locket. And, um, and then when they came back, they said, oh, the line was too long. He'll just go have to go back another day, which he did. He got his Massachusetts driver's license. And um, the locket on the, on the front, he, you know, chose the words. And it says on the front, forever and always. And on the back side, it says, nothing is ever, lo ever really lost to us as long as we remember. And inside, there's a picture of us 50 years ago and a picture of us last summer at a Tiger game. So despite himself, he was romantic. Um, and I won't go too much longer, but a little longer. Um, Tony would get on campaigns about things that he thought was unfair and he would write letters about them. It, it's happened on many times. Uh, one of them I remember was when he was at Tiger Stadium with Xander in a backpack and he took great offense to the security guard opening Xander's baby bottle and putting his nose in the opening to sniff the apple juice. <laughs> Tony wrote a, an indignant letter to the Tigers organization and I think he got some free tickets out of that, but he also made his point. <laughs> he wrote a similar letter to uh, the assisted living place where uh, his mother was living when she was nine, till she was 97, well, 97 to 100. And um, they sent this ridiculous letter. You pressed that emergency button 400 times, and because you did that, some people didn't get services, some people may die because of you. Can you believe they wrote a letter like that? Well, Tony couldn't believe it, so he started on his campaign. You can't send these letters to people. I mean, here she was, you know, in dementia, and they're sending a letter <sighs> like that. Anyway, uh, I, I found this morning, this journal was given by Joy to Tony, and I didn't think he wrote in it, and I brought it to write some words in, and I opened it up, and there was writing by Tony. And so I marked a few passages to share with you. I always try to be kind and inclusive, and maybe I was good at that, and now I'm reaping the reward. 
I think we agree, look at this room. Um, he also said, the end of life doesn't scare me, much harder on those I'm leaving behind. They suffer the grief, the fears, the missed opportunities, sharing their achievements. Mona to carve out, carve out a new life for her self. And I miss not being there to follow Sasha's journey and Linda Lee and to, and to continue following the future that Drea and Lindsay are building. I miss not being see, here to see Xander's career and family and my sister losing her last of our nuclear family. I'm confident that they will support each other. He was right about that. So I just urge you to do just as everyone said. Um, go up to someone you don't know today and tell them how you met Tony. Tell them a story about Tony. Hear from them the same thing. And then you'll have met that person through Tony. And that's Tony's networking style. Thank you so much for being here. I'm just going to piggyback on my mom. Um, and I, when I heard Joy's poem, and I, I feel like this is the rain and you are the birds coming back to feed. Um, um, I wanted to say that, to share it with you, that, and I, some of you know this, I had a dream about my dad a week after he died, and um, a visitation, if I would like to think of it as. and. We were together, and he came into the room in his usual style, very enthusiastic about this new place he was. And, you know, my dad was not a believer. He didn't believe any life after death. Um, just thought it ended, and that was it. And in his, my dream, he was so, like, excited and surprised because two people had met him, and he was already networking. <laughs> with lots of people and he just had that he looked like he was in his, in his 30s and he was had that exuberance that he always had and it just felt real and it made me feel like he's he's still doing his thing wherever he is um i also wanted to thank everyone um he was inclusive as we've said he was also inclusive in the raising of us so when i look out there i see so many of you that took part in the raising of us, so, and you're still here, so, I might be calling you now, but with some questions, um, I want to thank Lori specifically, um, Lori, um, I think my parents just threw me in her arms when I was about 18 months, six months old, they just met her and their babysitter didn't show up, so they were like, great, here's our baby, <laughs> um, but I think they saw something in her, hopefully, safety, um, <laughs> <laughs> and it began a lifelong friendship between Lori and I. And in my parents' inclusive style, they know that two parents can't provide everything for their child, and they need the help of their community and their village. And um, Lori's been one of those people for me, specifically through my adolescent years. And um, just knowing I could call her for the memorial that she would make it happen. And I know that, um, I don't know if Amy's still here and Mary, but there are other young women that have been blessed with having Lori in their life. Um, so I just wanted to say a special thank you to you. And thank you everybody for being here and for all the love and support along the way. And I told some of you this, but my dad first got diagnosed. <laughs> I said this today, we were down the Dana-Farber family room, you know, spinning like, you know, the, the, that conversation you never want to hear with a doctor. And he was like euphoric. It was really weird. He was like, 
well, I've had a great life. I've done this. I've done that. Wow. Like, he was just reflecting. I'm like, wow, I've had such an awesome. And he looked at us. He's like, I just feel bad for you guys. <laughs> so um, here we are. <laughs> Well, I learned a lot from my dad, I can say that. Um, this is an amazing legacy that he's left to see you guys. It makes me feel him in the room. Um, I was curious of how people were able to stand up and just share these stories throughout the night, and I realized that there's just some, a huge support of people looking on you as you stand up here and share those stories. So I'm glad that I was able to come up here and really connect to that. It's really beautiful the way that everybody has shared stories about my dad. And I think um, as it was coming closer to this date, I was realizing how important those are to us, to me and to us as a family and, um, and, memory, and remembering him. Um, you know, I think being so close to him at the very end, there's certain things that really just brought into relief what is important in life. and. The, one of those is how important each one of our stories is to the people that we love. So, I mean, my dad always found ways to tell his story and share stories with other people. And now gathering those stories, it's just, I mean, we have this precious life and this is where we make our story. And it's really amazing to see it celebrated in this way. And the other is to really, at the end, just make sure that you tell people that you love them. And I want to thank everybody for the hard work to put this together and the support through all the process and just to be so present here today. Um, I love you, we love you, and also to my family that we're still behind. I love <laughs> you guys. And we just thank you. <laughs> <laughs>